He swung on and hit the end of right field deep. And you can't forget about this one. Blaze Salter hits number five. And the Newport Gulls pre-take the lead. This is the Newport Gulls pregame show, live from Cardine's Field in Newport, Rhode Island. Gone! A grand slam! Two left power, right tower power, and the Gulls walk off in the 15th inning! Coming up, interviews, stats, standings, lineups, and a whole lot more. Come on, steps on the back for one out, throws the first, and he's in time, a double play! Pitch, breaking ball lifted deep to center field, and it is gone! A two-run shot for Cody Hosey. Taking a high drive, left field deep. Bolzano going back, looking up. This ball is a two-run homer. P.J. Jones hits it out. Stay tuned. The pregame show begins now on the NECBL Broadcast Network. In his first season covering Newport Gulls baseball, here's play-by-play -play broadcaster Stephen Huff. Playoff baseball is back in Newport as we get set for the 2019 Southern Division Wild Card matchup between the Newport Goals and Mystic Schooners. How you doing, everybody? Stephen Huff getting you set for tonight's matchup here on the NECBL Broadcast Network. Last time out for the Goals, the bats were still hot as they put up 16 runs en route to their 16-5 victory over the Winnipesaukee Muskrats. The Goals scored in each of the first six innings while hitting five home runs on the day. On the other side of things, Mystic comes into this one as the three seed in the Southern Division. Last time out, they fell to the number one team in the South, the Martha's Vineyard Sharks, by a score of 15 to 13. It's the Goals and Schooners right here on the NECBL Broadcast Network. The Goals pregame show starts right now. Welcome back to the pregame show here on the NECBL Broadcast Network. Nick Bell here with Hayden Jones. Now, Hayden, once a night with your debut at first first base. How did that come about? Like, what happened? Um. You know, I was behind the plate, and Chris with his back and everything, so it's next guy up. And we had another catcher come in, but we didn't have another first baseman. And so it's – I've played the infield before, so it just stuck me out there and did my thing. And so, you know, you did a pretty good job over there at first base, not going to lie. Um, what did you think about the position? Um, not a huge fan, but I'd rather be at third if I was not catching. But, I mean, if, it's, if I got to get the job done, then I'll get the job done. But it's not too bad, but – what would, what would you give your uh, performance like a letter grade for? See, I caught every ball. I mean, A plus, 100 percent best. I mean, told Chris, best first baseman on this team. I mean, easy. But yeah, yeah, right there, all American first baseman already. You think you can go out and take his job tonight? Uh, I mean, yeah, easily, yeah, all the time, yeah. <laughs> and so, on a more serious note. Uh, you know, you're in the playoffs now, um, so and you've been playing baseball for a couple months here now in Newport. Well, you know, are you tired at all? Are you, are, how are you feeling? Yeah, it's it's getting to that point where everyone's getting a little, it's a little worn out at the time, but it's when it comes to getting to the field and everything, it's you, you flip the switch a little bit and you, you know it's go time and everything, and you know what happens happens, and you go with the flow. But, yeah, it's getting to that worn out stage a little bit. You're walk around, guys want to go home and see their family and everything, but at the same time, you, this is your job and this is what we do for a living, so you got you just got to go out there and play like you always have and have fun with it. And it's a winner go home you know, game tonight. Uh, do, you, how, do you guys feel the impact of that importance tonight? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, there isn't much, I would say, worrying, stuff like that. It's more of guys are comfortable how we're playing right now and we're trying to go do our thing and We've been doing well with our hitting and everything, and our defense has been behind us, so that's the biggest thing that we have going for us. So just keep that going where we'll be good. And, you know, you, your time here in Newport is coming to a close. Uh, do you, are you going to miss these guys afterwards? Oh, yeah, big time. I've, I've gotten some big relationships and with the guys and a couple people I've met outside of the team, but especially with the team, like Vosik and Schmelz and everything. And I mean, those guys have been around a lot, and even others – that have been on the team, it's it's going to be a big part. It's going to be fun that you're going to think back on and be, wow, that's that's a big memory. But it's, then that comes next time, there's going to be more guys. But it's going to be this is one group that you'll for sure remember for a long time, and you'll be friends and see each other at each other's weddings, and everything for sure. And lastly, here you know you're playing Mystic, a team you've played multiple times this year. Uh, what's the scouting report? You know what's the strategy going into tonight? Um, really not throwing Garrett Schmelz is the biggest key right today. Um, yeah, don't want yeah. too many strikeouts. Uh, walks, jeez, I mean, um, oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, true. 
Um, no, it's the biggest thing is just going out there, doing our thing, and trying not not playing their game, but playing ours is the big key, and trying to have success with that side is the big thing. All right, Hayden, thank you. Good luck tonight. And the pregame show continues next on NECBL Broadcast Network. Welcome back to the Goals pregame show. It's time for the broadcaster's roundtable. Stephen Huff alongside the field reporter of the Newport Goals, Nick Bello, and the voice of the Mystic Schooners, Laura Hoover. Now, Nick, I'm going to turn to you first. Obviously, a big game ahead for the Goals, but they're fresh off a victory over Winnipesaukee. 16 runs, five home runs. The bats are hot right now, and that has to bode well for them going into the playoffs. Yeah, definitely a big momentum win uh, for their last game of the season to really close it out. Uh, yeah, but you, as you've said this past week, the Gulls bats have been absolutely on fire, and we'll see if they look to continue that tonight. Now tonight they're going up against a tough Mystic Schooner team. It's 3-3 three and three on the year between the Schooners and the Gulls. Uh, they got Trey McLaughlin on the mound, the starter for the Southern Division All-Star game. They got T.T. Bowens, the winner of the home run derby. It's a tough matchup. How are the Gulls going to get this one done? Yeah, definitely a tough matchup for the Gulls tonight, but as you said, they're 3-3 three and three on the season. They've split the season series, so I don't think, you know, there's not – much for Ghost fans to be worrying about or for this team to be worrying about at all. You know, just go out there, play your game, and we'll see who's the better team at the end. Now, Laura, I'm going to volley this one on over to you. Of course, the Schooners, three seed in the playoffs right now, uh, but they're fresh off a loss against the Martha's Vineyard Sharks by a score of 15-13. to 13. Talk a little bit about that loss and how the team's feeling coming into tonight. Well, honestly, the team's feeling pretty good. They were having a little bit more of a bullpen day, so not too much expectation coming forth from a win. Just want to have a nice game to play. Obviously, they got the bats working pretty early. T.T. Bowens breaking his record and the NECBL record in RBIs. Got two more home runs, so he's looking pretty well. And that also rested up by starting pitching, so we should be having pretty strong arms, solid bullpen today, and they're looking to come in, play a nice game, and a pretty solid game nonetheless. Now, I talked about uh, McLaughlin on the mound and Bowens with Nick. Of course, those are the stars in the lineup. Of course, there's a couple others, but talk a little bit about the impact that Bowens will have and McLaughlin on the mound. Well, McLaughlin is at his pitch count, is, is at his inning limit, so we're looking for him at three very solid innings. Uh, Bowen's, on the other hand, looking for a little bit more well-rounded uh, hitting aspect. He has come alive in the later half of the game or so, so we're looking for his bat to get hot early and getting men on base right before him as well. So if he's going to hit something long, you want him to hit something long with men on base rather than that solo home run shot. Well, it should be a good one. Goals and Schooners set for the Southern Division wild card matchup here on the NECBL Broadcast Network. The Goals pregame show t continues next. Welcome back to the Goals pregame show. It's time for the front office report. Stephen Huff joined alongside the Goals general manager and president, Chuck Pava. And Chuck, obviously, a couple weeks ago, we were talking about this team etched for that 25th win. That's a uh, landmark that both – the the Newport goals always try to hit to get in the playoffs. They got that. They got to 27. How do you feel about this team going into the playoffs? Yes, I feel as strong as um, I have with any team that has gotten to this point in the playoffs. I mean, this is a group of committed, determined young men. You've got a great combination with this team. You've got a, a group of older kids that are doing a great job of leading. And then you have some younger kids who are following the leadership of these older kids. So... It's, the chemistry's working. These guys look like they're pretty committed. So now it's baseball time. Yeah. Now, of course, uh, you're expected a big atmosphere tonight. First time the goals are back in the playoffs since 2016. Newport's the place to be. How about the atmosphere? Talk a little bit about that and what you're expecting. Well, you know, I, it's, it's funny, Stephen, because um, it's not always as easy to fill this place for a playoff game as you might imagine because playoff games aren't on everybody's schedule you got to be a rabid fan to know that we're playing tonight other than you know all the pocket schedules media guides and posters that we've had out so sometimes we're, we're surprised at the, the the size of the crowd not being as big as we would like to see so we have to do a pretty significant effort of getting people to know that the game's on tonight but social media helps a lot so between the effort that all you guys have done uh, hopefully that's the difference. Well, I know a lot of us have been trying to get uh, the word out and get people here, so it should be a fun one tonight. Now, of course, part of your job is, is supplying the team with depth. A lot of times, a lot of teams struggle with losing guys at the end of the season, but the goals look to be strong. They're heating up at the right time, and it looks like they still have that depth. Yeah, we, we you know we have position-wise, we're, we're deep. Um, we lost a couple of players. Austin James just went home uh, two days ago. Uh, Hudson Haskin cannot play tonight because he's got a groin injury that's bothering him and he's nagging him and we cannot afford to let him get hurt. So 
we're going to miss those guys. Um, position pitcher wise, we just lost two very good back end of the bullpen guys, Carson Rudd and uh, Mike Townsend, both very very big arms for us. But we still have enough here. We still have enough firepower. These guys. The amazing thing about this team is that every night is somebody different. You're watching this team. The other night it went up to Winnipesaukee and they had three kids couldn't go because of different little injuries that we wanted to give them another day day off. And coach said, hey, we're down by quite a few players, but he ended up scoring 16 runs. Everybody in a different night is taking charge with this team. It's all older guys, and it's fun to watch. It really is. Yeah, and it should be a good one tonight. Goals and Schooners coming up next here on the NECBL Broadcast Network. The Goals pregame show continues right now. Welcome back to the Goals pregame show. It's time for the manager show. Steven Hoff alongside the Goals head coach, Kevin Winterroad. And coach, the bats come into this one the hottest in the NECBL over the last two weeks. Uh, that's a great time to heat up. How do you feel about your team matching up in the lineup right now? Well, I like our offense against just about anybody else's, so I feel comfortable with that aspect. But we've got to pitch and play defense and kind of take care of all three aspects when you're playing in playoff baseball, especially a one-game uh, playoff. Now, of course, it is a one-game playoff. How, how do you approach it with the pitchers out there? I know you guys bullpened uh, the other day against Winnipesaukee to try to keep the pitch counts low on everyone. So what's your plan of attack out here tonight? Our plan of attack is to use every guy down there that we can legally throw to win this game to get to the next one. Of course, Sam Jacobsack will be that starter to go on the mound for the goals. What do you like about him starting the game tonight? I just like that he attacks people with his fastball and he has good off-speed stuff to go with it, but uh, we're going to need to try and keep his pitch count down, and when guys pitch with their fastball, that tends to happen a lot. All right, thanks, Coach. Good luck out there tonight. He's Kevin Winterode. I'm Stephen Up. The Goals at Schooners coming up next here on the NECBL Broadcast Network. Once again, here's Stephen Huff and the Newport Gulls broadcast team. Win or go home, that's what's at stake here in the 2019 Southern Division NECBL Wild Card Game. As we welcome you into Cardines Field for tonight's matchup between the Newport Goals and Mystic Schooners. Stephen Huff joined alongside Laura Hoover, the voice of the Mystic Schooners, and Nick Bello, the field reporter of the Newport Goals. And this is the opening weekend of the NECBL playoffs. As we said, this is it. The winner goes on. The loser, their season is over. It's a good matchup tonight between the Schooners and Goals. Series tied at three on the season. And let's just get right into it, Laura. This Mystic team uh, stumbling a little bit towards the end of the season into the playoffs, but they clinched that three seed, and they still have a lot of formidable players. Uh, they had six All-Stars. Uh, they have a good team here today. Yeah, really, like you said, they kind of stumbled into it, had a stretch of uh, a losing streak really towards the back half of the season, and that really came from the shaky bullpen. That's what we're going to be looking at tonight. If the Schooners can hold tight to their pitchers, they will walk toe-in-toe -toe with Newport and... You said 3-3 three and three in the season, but Scooters are really holding tight to that 2-1 and one record here at Newport. And that doesn't come without effect. They did lose a few players that have played here, so it's going to be interesting to see. Definitely the outfielders. We have Justice Burke DHing tonight. We have Ben Maycock in right field, and those are the guys that we're going to look at who haven't played here. And the little bit of disconnect between that gel and the team all season long and, and, and the, the new field to play. But at the same time, you got players like T.T. Bowens who can hit yard. You got David Beam hitting for average. Steve Barmakian finally breaking out of his slump. So top of the order really doing the work. And coming back, Will Lucas, Kessinger, and then Seamus Berry behind the dish. So it's going to be a fantastic lineup. I'm interested to see later in the game how this pitching matchup is going to be lining up. And I think that's really going to be the key tonight is how the pitching stacks up. Not so much the hitting because both these teams – Powerful hitters, fantastic hitters, and we know that we've seen both of these lineups go for the win in hitting. And even though we said Schooners are stumbling into the playoffs, they still put up 13 runs the other yeah. night against the best team in the NECBL record-wise, the Martha's Vineyard Sharks. Talk a little bit about that game. I know you guys already clinched at that point, so uh, a loss really didn't make the difference to any, between a, a win or a loss at that point because you couldn't move up or down, but you ended up falling to the Sharks by a score of 15-13, to 13, and it was an exciting one. Well, the Schooners pitched in uh, one of their new pitches in Dylan Benton, and they really wanted to use him, test him out, see how far he can get, and, and, and get some life out of him. 
in case the Schooners do go on, they will be calling it to him from the, from the pen. So they definitely wanted to get some life in, in, in some of the new pitchers. And then, and then after that, it was a bullpen day. They wanted to get the deep bullpen working, and that's really where you saw the disconnect. And the Vineyard did the same deal. Pitch bullpen, but had the same lineup, the power hitters on top. Maybe a little bit shift here and there, but hitting-wise, absolutely great hitting from the Schooners. And I, again, I will attribute to that to a little bit of the bullpen day. Pitchers, slower, not so much heat, where they like it. So the, the feeling it out, getting the heavy guys, you got David Beam on rest, you got Jerry Huntsinger on rest, you got the starters on rest. So it was a fun game. They really took the bats off the shoulders. It hit for the long ball. T.T. Bowens, two more run, uh, home runs. And on top of that, of course, Bowens broke the single season RBI record. And that was just kind of a fun game to, to go ahead and, and capitalize on, on, on some of those records that they were close to. Well, it should be a fun one here tonight as well. Last time out for Newport, they took on the Winnipesaukee Muskrats in their final game of the regular season. The goals won that one by a game or a score of 16 to 5. The goals scored in each of the first six innings of that ball game, including five home runs. He had a career day from Ryan Tours, who had two two-run home runs. Joey Bellini also had a home run. Scott Holzwasser took the first pitch of the game. He took that one yard. That was one of the home runs. And then Justin Henry Malloy, who leads the team in home runs, also had one. It was a scoring fest for the goals. Their bats have been hot, but like it was for the Vineyard and like it was for Mystic, it was a bullpenning day for Newport. They wanted to throw guys as many as they can to keep pitch count lows, uh, pitch count low on all of their guys, um, and prepare them for the playoffs here today. Only uh, goals through six pitchers. None of them went over two innings pitched. You had Brian Gursky start the game. He gave up two runs, but after that, Dylan Brown had a one-two-three inning and just one inning pitched. Mike Sansone gave up one hit and a strikeout in just one innings pitched. You saw Cam Fair come out of the pen for one inning. Jimmy Kingsbury with two innings out of the pen. And then Bo Broody getting his first appearance for the goals after a late addition from the University of Rhode Island. Um, and it's kind of like the same thing that Mystic was doing the other night, just trying to get some of those arms that they haven't been able to use a lot, especially with Broody. They wanted to see what he had to offer. But pitching was well, went well for the goals the other day, but the bats are the main story. Before that, they scored nine runs against Martha's Vineyard, eight runs the night before against Upper Valley. This is a strong offensive team coming into tonight, and this is the right time to heat up. It's going to be interesting to watch both of these teams. Like, like you said, it's, it's the right time to heat up. Schooner's kind of coming off of some easy pitching ability, so it, it's going to be interesting to watch them go back to the starters, really big guns coming through. And I did hear a little bit of word coming from the, the Schooner's coaching staff that the potential is to throw two big guns back to back. And that is what I'm looking for. If Schooners don't go to the bullpen early with Trey McLaughlin on the mound, then they may go Trey McLaughlin, Ryan McLinsky back to back, or Trey McLaughlin, Tyler Schaff back to back, which would, in theory, try and guarantee that win on the pitching side. But that does have them in a very tight situation if they face the vineyard. You're throwing two starters back to back. Right, and especially if you go McLaughlin and Shaw. For those of you that don't know and have been following Mystic Schooners baseball as much, those were the two uh, first two pitchers on the mound for the Southern Division All-Stars. They've been excellent all season, and they're going to uh, possibly throw them both out there today because, frankly, the season's on the line. So it doesn't matter yeah. who's starting tomorrow if you don't win here today. And also, Shaw pitches very well against Newport. He had a start a few days ago, so they definitely want to get him some rest. But if you're using Shaw for maybe two, three innings just to kind of close things down, then you could get some work out of him. Shaw already threw an immaculate inning the other night against Winnipesaukee, and they still were trying to take the win home with them. Yeah, so it could be a good one tonight, especially if McLaughlin and Shaw come out on the mound. It'll be uh, the best against the best, as we're going to send it down to the field for tonight's national anthem. Oh, 
broad stripes and bright stars through the peril is flight for the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming in the Tonight's national anthem was sung by Rev Record of the Newport Sock Exchange. So we get set for first pitch here in the Southern Division wild card game. Stephen Huff alongside the voice of the Mystic Schooners, Laura Hoover, and the field reporter of the Newport Goals, Nick Bellow. And we've teased this game enough. Laura, who is going to be the bats in the Schooners lineup? Well, leading off, Steve Bar making he's going to be out at third base tonight. David Beam back in center field following. T.T. Bowens, number three, also going to be the third baseman. Cleaning things out, Ben Maycock, which the Newport Goals have yet to see tonight. And he's going to be out right field. Will Lucas stops by behind Maycock. Uh, he's going to be the shortstop. Nolan Kessinger finding himself out in left field tonight. Seamus Barry behind the dish. Justice Burke, D.H. in this evening. And Josh McGuire to line up. The order for the Schooners, he is going to be your second baseman. And, of course, Trey McLaughlin up on the mound on the other half of the inning. We'll showcase McLaughlin in just a sec. The starter on the mound for the goals is Sam Jacobsack. This will be his 12th appearance, only his second start, but through 21 and two thirds innings pitched, he just has a 1.66 ERA. He's been one of the goals better arms this season. He's given up just seven runs for them earned off of 18 hits and two walks. He has 30 strikeouts in those 21 and two thirds. So when you're talking about, you know, strikeouts to walk, 30 to two is, uh, I ex absolutely ideal, it's better than that, it's phenomenal, and you can't ask much more. So they're putting one of their best arms out there on the mound today. In the Newport lineup though, Scott Holzwasser will be leading things off. He's the shortstop today. Following him is Greg Cavalieri, the URI left fielder. Batting third is Chris Hamilton, the Stony Brook first baseman. The cleanup man in the goals order is Justin Henry Malloy, who'll be tonight's designated hitter. Batting fifth is Brett Vosick, University of Kansas right fielder. After him is Colton Bender, the Quinnipiac catcher. Following Bender is Hayden Jones of Mississippi State. He'll be playing third base tonight for the second time this season. An eighth spot for the goals lineup is Joey Bellini. He'll be playing second base. And rounding out the order is Isaiah Thomas, the center fielder from Vanderbilt. Of course, we talked about Trey McLaughlin. He's the one starting tonight. But uh, what are his numbers and what can you expect from him out on the mound? Well, you can expect that nasty curveball that he's been throwing all summer long. He, I talked to him the other day, and he said he's been throwing the best that he's ever thrown this summer. So you're really looking for that curveball, that fastball, and, of course, that changeup that we all saw at the All-Star game. But he is having a 2.75 ERA. Seven games appeared. He's got four wins, one loss, no saves. 36 innings pitched. 48 strikeouts, six batters walked, and that's the power that we've been seeing off him, although 27 hits off of him. But like I said earlier, McLaughlin having that three inning limit. So I know Dennis Long, the pitching coach, asked uh, Fairfield if uh, McLaughlin could pitch more innings if he kept at the pitch count minimum. I have not heard otherwise, uh, whether he was able to go more than three innings or Three innings is dead set, so I'm interested to see, will he be pulled after three? Will he keep the 65 in uh, pitch count limit? Well, it'll be interesting to see. Calling the balls and strikes tonight is Charles Campbell behind the plate in the field for the umpiring crew. Tyler Bullock and Tony Letizio. So we take a look at the weather tonight. At first pitch, it's a sunny 76 degrees here in the city by the sea. 81% humidity with a nine mile per hour wind coming from the south southwest. So, Absolutely beautiful day for baseball, Nick. Oh, absolutely. I mean, can't, can't get better than this. It's Saturday here in Newport. The fans are here. 
The sun is out. The weather is nice. Let's play some ball. Now, of course, these aren't the only games um, on the on tap here tonight. We'll get to those in just a sec as we look at the defensive alignment for the goals. Cavalieri, Thomas, and Vosick from left to right in the outfield. From the infield, Hayden Jones, Holzwasser, Bellini, and Chris Hamilton, and Colton Bender behind the plate. But as we said, it's the wild card game in the Southern Division here today. It's also the wild card game in the Northern Division. Talk a little bit about what's happening around the league, Nick. Yeah, so we got the Keen Swap Bats who won the Northern Division. They have a bye today. And so the only other game going on other than here is Vermont Mountaineers visiting the Valley Blue Sox. That is game is being played up in Holyoke. That game is actually getting, around, getting started around this time right now. And then in the Southern Division, we got the Martha's Vineyard Sharks, who have the first round bye. Winner of this game goes to Martha's Vineyard tomorrow. We'll see who that is. And how about the Valley game yesterday? It was a doubleheader for them against North Adams, who is currently second in the North. Valley needed to win both or win one and tie one. Valley ended up sweeping the doubleheader, knocking North Adams completely out of postseason play. Valley clinched it up, and they're in action here tonight. That was an intense game to watch, too, because it was such a game riding on, and I don't think many people thought that there was going to be a sweep for doubleheader. Generally speaking, the NACBL, you go for the split in the doubleheader, but Valley absolutely pulled out everything and got the clinch with the sweep, and that really surprised me, and, and then also solidified how well this North Division, well, actually all of them, have been playing. We are set for action here at Cardines. First batter up for the Schooners is Steve Barmakian with Sam Jacobsack on the mound. First offering from Jacobsack, fastball. Just missing up for ball one. Barmakian, that patient player that we're going to be seeing tonight, draws the walk, draws the uh, ball magnet hit by pitch, although he can hit for average. So he's going to line this one into right, and that will be a leadoff single for Mystic, exactly how they want to start this wild card game here today. Though they do have a little bit of an issue of leaving men on base, especially in the situation where bases are loaded. Uh, last time, one of the last times the Schooners were here, that wasn't an issue, but since then it has become progressively more and more of a habit that they can't get rid of. Barmakian at first for the Schooners, third on the team in steals this season. Jacob Sack looks on now to David Beam. They throw over to first, but Barmakian is back in time. And Barmakian's not one of those guys who gives it a generous leadoff. He's fairly shallow to the plate, er, to the bag at first base, but he gets picked off or attempted to quite often. That old first pitch slider catches the outer half. 0-1 now from Jacob Sack. Winner goes on to play the Martha's Vineyard Sharks tomorrow. That will be a three-game series. That one is thrown over to first, but back in time is Barmakian. And this series is tied at three, but Mystic has uh, won two here at Cardines already on the season. They are two and one here while the goals are two and one at Mystic as that pitch misses outside, one and one. And pretty much both of those games have been one on the long ball for the Schooners. Uh, that double uh, home run shot by David Beam in the first game appearance and then the grand slam by Isaiah Byers. It's now Jacob Sack looking on on the 1-1. Fastball that skips in front of the plate. Bender blocks it but it's going to skip away towards the dugout for the goals and that will put Barmakian on second as he advances on the plate. Yeah, wild pitch nicely blocked up but again that speed coming from Jacob Sack just got away from Bender and Barmakian Lead off man, able to run the bases. Uh, but if you're gonna give someone the green light, it's gonna be both Huntsinger and David Beam, the two top speeders on the Schooners team. As Beam is at the plate looking on against Jacob Sack, the starter on the mound for the goals. The 2-1, fastball gonna be chopped over to second base. Bellini with it onto his left, throws the first in time for out number one. But it is a productive out for the Schooners as Barmakian moves up 90 feet, and he is now 90 feet from scoring the first run of the day. And that's all the Schooners really want, is to be able to advance the base runners. Again, play that little bit of small ball, stop relying on Maycock and Bowens to really hit big, and this is where we start to see, uh, I was talking a little bit before the game started, 
you can't pitch around TT anymore. You got ben, ben Maycock threatening. He is just equal in height and stature and power as Bowens, but the lefty on the other side of the, the plate. As it is, the lefty favorable park with only 285 down the line as that first pitch breaking ball drops into the zone for strike one. Bowens, of course, first on the team in hits for Mystic, also just broke the NECBL single season record for RBI in a season. That 0-1 fastball spiked in front of the plate. Nice block there from Colton Bender. Also, I do want to mention that I love TT's new bat, uh, the Green Barrel Dream Bat with uh, stars actually aligned on the green part of the barrel with the uh, silver ribbing between the green and the tan. The best bat I've seen on the team so far. Looks brand new as Bowens last Sunday was the home run derby champion. Out in Vermont is that 1-1 breaking ball swung on and missed, one and two. He had 40 home runs in just two rounds and his 16 in the first three minutes in the first round, then 24 in four minutes in the second round. And it was the best showcase I've seen in a college home run derby. Is this one two offering, another breaking ball gonna be popped up into shallow right. She going back a little bit as the ball's carrying is Vosick, he's there for out number two. Tagging from third is Barmakian, and the throw to the plate is going to be cut off. So that will score the first run of the day for Mystic. As they take an early 1-0 lead. Uh, TT's bat actually debuted in the previous game against Martha's Vineyard Sharks. So back to that heavyweight uh, barrel. At the same time, you're right. That was an absolutely incredible Incredible performance by Bowens. And I was talking to Dennis Long, the pitching coach, who pitched to TT uh, at, after the showcase, and he said, yeah, I signaled for TT to take a break because we thought that he wasn't going to make it. And then they realized that he's got four teams. Like, oh, yeah, we got this in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> this first offering fastball to Ben Maycock in there for strike one. Yeah, uh, he hit 14, and then he took a break, and he hit 16 eventually in the first round, 24 in the second round. and. It was just, no one was even close to it. As this one's going to be lofted into right. Vosick going back towards the Ivy. And he's there for out number three. So that will end things here in the top of the first. But the Schooners break the ice off a sacrifice fly from T.T. Bowens. Driving in Steve Bormakian. So Mystic takes an early 1-0 lead here on the NECBL Broadcast Network. 1-0 Schooners lead here in the bottom of the first. In the 2019 Southern Division Wild Card game, win or go home, and the Schooners have turned to their ace on the mound. It's Trey McLaughlin. Trey McLaughlin, one of the best pitchers on this Schooner team, able to, to throw that curveball. We touched this on the first time that McLaughlin actually came to the mound all the way back. Uh, the first game that both these teams played, and it's kind of a nice uh, comeback circle for all of us, especially McLaughlin. Uh, that uncharacteristic slur ball coming from him, although the fastball and the changeup he's been going to pretty regularly as well. As he goes to the fastball and the first offering is Scott Holzwasser, the leadoff man for the goals, and it's in there for strike one. McLaughlin, as you said, has only played the goals once. It was on opening day, and it was quite the showcase here. As this one's going to be chopped softly over to third bar, making a charge. It throws the first in time for out number one. But McLaughlin in that opening day Matchup between these two sides went five and a thirds innings pitch. Didn't give up a run, gave up just two hits and a walk while striking out eight in those five and a third. Yeah, he's been absolutely nasty on the mound and continues to produce for the Schooners. If he can beat out his inning limit, more than likely you're going to see him go five and maybe six innings with, with under 70 pitches. This first pitch to Greg Cavalieri. He swings that and pops it into the screen along the third baseline, 0-1. And, and Cavalieri's got probably, probably the smartest idea. McLaughlin's going to throw that fastball right out of the gate trying to catch these guys off guard. He swings again at a fastball and is able to line it back into the screen just a tad late on it, 0-2. Cavalieri comes into this one with the best average on the Newport Goals team. Also been hitting for a little bit of power lately. Nine doubles, had his first home run about two weeks ago against his former team from last year, the North Adams Steeplecats. And he's bumped all the way up from the nine hole into the two hole here today. As that 0-2 breaking ball misses up, 1-2. and two. Yeah, you just saw this coming all season, or well, the, the end of the season at least, for Greg Cavalieri. 
This one two fastball check swing from Cavalier. He's able to foul it off at the plate. He's one of the goals bats who's really gone hot so far to, to end the season. And I mean, to see him, you know, by, batting behind Scott Holswasser, it, it was very predictable. And you like to see something like that from a local guy. Now this one two. Another off speed missing up two and two. Yeah, you said he was heating up and him and the rest of the team for the goals have really been heating up. It's McLaughlin now on the 2-2. Fastball going to be driven right back up the middle. And that's the first hit of the day for Newport. As Cavalieri is now aboard first. But the goals, their last 10 games, they've been the best hitting team in the NECBL. They posted a 322 average across those 10 games. Have had 11 home runs in those 10 games as well. It's a team that is heating up at the right time. We know the pitching is there. The hitting it just hasn't been able to catch fire for a long period of time. Um, but they come into this one, the hottest team at the plate in the last 10 games. Now McLaughlin looking on at Chris Hamilton. First pitch fastball he thought about but held back, and it's going to miss up for ball one. Definitely a good read by Hamilton. Barry was trying to frame it a little bit more downstairs. Didn't really get the call off of it, though. Now McLaughlin, righty lefty matchup. Another fastball, this one missing low, 2 0. Hamilton comes into this one, writing a 29 game on base streak for Newport. He's hitting 3 0 3 for the goals. And had some home runs his last couple times out. Last one coming here at Cardine says that 2 0 pitch misses up. Count now 3 0 to Hamilton. We saw this also a little bit of Tyler Schaff last time the screeners were here, but. All the starting pitchers have taken about an inning, maybe two-thirds of an inning, to really warm up and really feel the mound. It's that 3-0 pitch fastball in there, 3-1. As we said, McLaughlin, we know he has the stuff, even though he's struggling with Caban, maybe in this at-bat against Chris Hamilton. He was the starter for the Southern Division All-Star team, though, McLaughlin was. He went one innings pitch, didn't give up a run, as this one's going to be floated into center field. Beam's going back, he's looking up, and that ball is gone. Home run for Chris Hamilton, and that gives the goals a two to one lead here in the Southern Division Wild Card game. And it's gonna be one of those nights where it's the hitter's night, and that was an absolutely gorgeous shot, mean shot by Chris Hamilton, and give credit to him because that went soaring. We talked about his on-base streak, we talked about his home runs as of late, both of them come to fruition in this at bat on that 3-1 count. His on base streak is now up to 30 games and he has now five home runs on the season, tying him for second on the team. And those past three home runs for him have come in all the past two weeks. So he's heating up, as we said, at the perfect time. And now brings up Justin Henry Malloy. He's the designated hitter today for the goals as that first pitch fastball misses in 1-0. Malloy hitting 324 for Newport. He leads the team in home runs with six, just one more now. Then Chris Hamilton. That 1-0 pitch miss is up 2-0. Also tied for second on home runs on the team is Scott Holswasser with five and Hudson Askin, who is out of the lineup today with five as well. Now this 2-0 pitch fastball tipped into the glove of Barry, 2-1. McLaughlin having a little bit of trouble. He's trying to look, it looks like paint the corners, that curveball missing just outside every single time that he pitches it. The fastball starting to get away from him. I think he's trying to overthrow it, get a little more heat off of it. There's a nice breaking ball from McLaughlin as it drops into the zone, two and two. Goals looking to keep the pressure on here in the first. They now lead two to one off the Hamilton two run home run. This 2-2 pitch, check swing, going to be grounded softly over to the left side of the infield. Sliding is Barmakian, and he can't make a throw over to first. An infield single for Malloy. That's the third straight batter to reach on a hit for the goals. It was interesting because if Barmakian made the throw, he probably could have beat the runner over to first. He had the time. Bowens was set waiting, and Barmakian was already up on his feet well in advance. Not only that, it's interesting that he cut off Lucas, who I thought had a better play on it to at least throw to first because Barmakian had to slide to get that ball, but it works out for the goals as Malloy is now on first. First offering to Brett Vosick misses low, 1-0. 
Fawcett comes into this one leading the team in hits with 46 on the season. This 1-0 pitch, another fastball. This one catching the bottom edge of the zone, 1-1. One and one. It's a bit uncharacteristic to see Will Lucas at the shortstop position. That 1-1 one, one breaking ball drops beneath the zone. As Isaiah Byers is normally the guy who holds uh, pretty steady at uh, uh, shortstop, but I, I know he's been feeling uh, some pain coming off of this season just in general and didn't have the best of nights uh, out, out against Martha's Vineyard, so maybe taking some rest is a good idea. This 2-1 pitch is going to be blasted in the right field. Maycock coming on in right, and he's going to drop the ball. He's going to pick it up and throw to second, though, because Malloy was headed back to first because he thought it was a routine play that Maycock was going to make. And so Malloy is now out on the force out at second. I thought Maycock had it too, honestly. He was he was planted way way underneath it, able to get there, and I suppose it'll be a fielder's choice. That will be a fielder's choice. As Malloy or Bostic is now aboard first. Malloy was out at second on the play, so. Runner on first with two away here. Bottom of the first with Colton Bender up at the plate for the goals. First pitch, breaking ball that just misses inside, 1-0. Yeah, definitely one of those weird situations right there. Um, you know, where you, you see a guy kind of have a good eye on the ball and he just drops it. So this pitch is going to be swung on and missed from Bender. Fastball down the middle. Bender's another one of the guys heating up for the goals. The game against Upper Valley a couple nights ago was three for three with an RBI double. Also had two walks on the day as he scored a run. This 1-1 one, one is going to be off speed, going to be hit into right field foul territory on top of the warehouse. One and two. Vosick was going on the play. Looked like a hit and run situation for Newport. So according to the official rules, it can't be an error because it was a fielder's choice. So yeah, that, and that's what it went down as, as a fielder's choice from Maycock into Lucas at second. So almost a saving grace, if, if, if you're Maycock, you don't record the error, you record an out either way. Yeah, it's, they're trading the same thing. So this pitch is gonna miss low and away, but they're gonna say Bender went around on the check swing, four strike three. First strikeout of the day for McLaughlin and that will end things here in the first. But the goals do take the lead. It was a two run home run from Chris Hamilton heading into the second. It's two to one, Newport on the NECBL Broadcast Network. Top of the second here at Cardines. It's playoff baseball and the goals have an early two to one lead thanks to the Chris Hamilton two run shot at the bottom half of the first to take the lead for the first time on the day for Newport. Stephen Huff alongside Laura Hoover, the voice of the Mystic Schooners and Nick Bellow, the field reporter of the Newport goals as it is Sam Jacobsack still out there on the mound for Newport, facing off against the five hitter in the Schooners lineup to lead off the second inning, Will Lucas. Lucas, a guy who came in at, at the later half of this season, actually injuring himself, going sliding into a second base bag out of Vermont, and since then he's been hitting actually a lot better. So this first pitch to Lucas, fastball in there for strike one. He's, he's actually been a little bit more tighter, a little more gentler to his pinky, and that has changed his swing actually for the better, and he's capitalized a lot of it. He's seen his first home run ever since he's, he's come back, and quite a few doubles and uh, singles. The 0 one pitch was in there. Strike two now to Will Lucas. Jacobsack looking on, working from the first base side of the rubber tonight. He said at the letters out of the windup on the 0-2. Fastball misses up and in one and two. Last time out for Sam Jacobsack was his first start on the year. He did also didn't make a start for Northeastern this spring. But against the New Bedford Base Sox, he went six innings, giving up just one run off of seven hits and four strikeouts. So this pitch is going to be a slider that's going to be lined back into the screen. Lucas has been reading the ball very well in the past few games. You can see that here tonight. Fouling back, reading some uh, of those pitches that are just inside, and... You know what, he's taking the bat off his shoulder. He's trying to have a little bit of fun. He's trying to stay loose. This 1-2 fastball check swing. They're going to say it tipped the bat, and Bender was able to squeeze it. 
Four strike three. First strikeout of the day for Jacob Sack. And there's going to be a meeting between the umpires because what happened was it was a check swing from Lucas. And he says it went off of his wrist into Bender's glove. And so he wants first base. And so they would have to confer on this one, whether or not he went around or not. And what all happened here. But if it was off the bat, Bender caught it. So that would be strike three. And looking at the ruling, it looks like they are going to stick with the initial call on the field. So it is the first strikeout of the day for Jacob Sack. That's some dangerous territory by Will Lucas. You can't get this heated in only the second inning of work because you do have the rest of the game. You don't want to make the umpire that much more angry at you. You're in danger then of risking a, a, an ejection or suspension of play. And this in, in this critical situation, you can't risk that. That first pitch to Kessinger was in there for strike one. Yeah, losing anyone at this point would be tough for either side. Now Jacob Sack, righty on lefty matchup. 0-1 offering, going to be a breaking ball that just misses up for ball one. At the same time, though, I think the umpires made the correct call. You know, they confirmed with each other. It's a tough play to see. I mean, we have replay up here. We can kind of see it, but it's, it's a tough play to see. That 1-1 one -one fastball going to be grounded sharply past the bag at first and over towards the warehouse. It's at least a single for Kessinger. He slips the throw down to Jacob Sack, who's covering the bag, is there, and he tags him out for out number two. Uh, I think there's going to be actually a conference about that as Coach Orby, the head coach and the third base coach out here, is going to try and argue that, that Kessinger that actually just overran. It was not intending to go to second base. They're actually looking to see if that's a ground rule double because the ball hit the warehouse and went up for just a split second underneath some of the banners we have over there. Um, and then it popped right back out. As you can see, the ball roll in, does go underneath, and then comes back out because of the warehouse. And so you're looking at the Mystic side Ooh. wanting a ground rule double on this one. And we're waiting to see the ruling from the umpire here. Um, and this is an interesting one. Uh, oh. As we get the whole umpire and crew in on this. Uh, you look at the uh, Ivy and Wrigley, and if the ball gets stuck in there and you're searching for it, you can keep running. If you don't search for it, then it's a ground rule double. Also, uh, if the ball pops in and pops out, it's a live ball. But here at Cardines, I don't know the official ruling. I'm assuming it's something of the, of the nature. Well, that's exactly what I was waiting for on that call. It looked, looked to me like the ball went underneath the tarps over there. And I was actually waiting for a ground rule double call, but when, when one didn't come, I was kind of confused. I mean, you can see the ball popped out. They are going to rule him out on the play because the ball went in and then came out. And now you're going to see Mystic arguing with the call even more. And the home plate umpire, Charles Campbell, is not having any of it at this point. And we're no ejection or anything. It seems like a, a pretty calm conversation as of now. And There is two outs here at Cardines. So that will now bring up Seamus Berry. It was calm for a minute. It didn't end calm. No, and, and uh, I know Coach Orby has been very frustrated at the end of the season by the way his players have been trying to run, but. That first pitch <laughs> off speed in there. Missed outside for ball one. There's something to be said about so, some calls this late of the season, you want to get guys around, so. 1-0 fastball misses up and away. Oh, I understand, you know, arguing your point, but that ball clearly went in and clearly came out. It seemed like a playable ball. And so I don't know if he really had much of an argument to it as now this 2-0 pitch fastball swung on and missed from Barry, 2-1. Yeah, that right there is definitely one of those calls you have to be consistent on. Yeah, it, but I think it relates most to the IV at Wrigley is, is if it stays in, then you could argue a ground rule double. Is that 2-1 change or swung on at the knees? 2-2. Two and two. But because it went in and came out, seems like a live ball at that point. Yeah, I mean, that's what I would think, the reason why they didn't call it, because you can see, clearly see the ball come out, and Hamilton made a play on it. Now the 2-2. Two, two. Catches him looking at the bottom edge of the zone. Strike three, second strikeout of the day for Jacob Sack. And he works an unorthodox 1-2-3 inning 
here in the top of the second, heading into the home half of the second. It's 2-1 goals here on the NECBL Broadcast Network. 2-1, goals on top, heading into the bottom of the second here in Newport. It is Trey McLaughlin on the mound. He'll be facing the 7-8-9 hitters in this goals lineup. Aiden Jones leading things off. He'll be followed by Joey Bellini and Isaiah Thomas. Jones comes into tonight hitting 282 on the season for Newport. Been heating up recently though, absolutely squaring every ball up. It's McLaughlin first offering to Jones. Gonna be lined into left over a jumping. Lucas at short. And that's a leadoff single for Hayden Jones in the Newport goals. Yeah, Lucas was almost there. He jumped a little tad too early. Maybe another half step back and then a, a jump may have been able to land, land something on his glove. But yeah, just kind of bad bounce into it. Not able to really take hold of it. That hasn't been the strong contact we've been used to seeing from Hayden Jones at the plate recently, but it's a hit either way and he'll take it. Joey Bellini is now up with the plate. First pitch fastball low and inside for ball one. And McLaughlin really needs to start working in the zone if he's going to try and close out these innings in quick succession. Because if he's allowing the, this much hit off of him, then he is working into very dangerous territory. It's 1-0 fastball up and in. Bellini the other night against Winnipesaukee. Again, I talked about how the goals put up 16 runs in that game. A lot of it was because of Joey Bellini. He was a triple shy from the cycle. He went three for four with a home run on the day. Is that 2-0 pitch? In there for strike one. Also worked a walk against the Muscarats. Bellini's just one of those guys that started off a little bit slow, but he's heating up now at the end of the season, and that's exactly what you want, especially from a guy in the eighth hole of this lineup. Is that 2-1? It's going to be spiked on the outside up part of the plate. It's going to get away from the catcher, Barry. And moving up to second on the wild pitch is Hayden Jones. The pitch in, there was a check swing from Bellini, but he didn't go around, and so the count is now three and one. It's McLaughlin already in some trouble here in the second with a runner in scoring position and no outs. Facing a hitter's count here to Bellini, the three one fastball misses up. Ball four, and that's McLaughlin's first walk of the day. And it puts runners on first and second with no outs here in the top of the second. Not something you generally see out of McLaughlin, and I'm starting to wonder, is he feeling the nerves of this game? Feeling a little bit tired, maybe a little bit mix of both, because it looks like he's trying to overthrow. He's throwing fairly consistently high inside balls tonight. And you're hearing a lot of the Cardines atmosphere getting into it, the Newport faithful, and that just helps the goals out and hurts McLaughlin a little bit out there out on, the mound, on the mound. It might add to some of those nerves he may be experiencing right now. Is this first pitch fastball driven into the right center gap. Beam and Maycock convening. Maycock is there for out number one. Tagging up to third on the play is Jones as the throw is not in time. Although putting one away, that's all the Schooners really care about. Yes, the goals are threatening at third base, but I mean, McLaughlin, or not McLaughlin, Maycock having a cannon of an arm. Just the little bit of a misplay, if he threw as soon as he made the catch, which is a, a very hard play to do. Maybe he would have been in there in time. Maybe try and throw to Lucas at second base, cut off the runner at, at going, moving over at third. Uh, multiple plays, but uh, uh, overall, just solid by Maycock. So that flips the lineup over for the goals as this first pitch to Scott Holzwasser drops into the zone for strike one. Holzwasser comes into this one second on the team in doubles and tied for second in home runs while also hitting 346 as he offers at this breaking ball that drops out of the zone 0 and 2. But he's your typical leadoff guy that can also work walks, but Nick, a sneaky amount of power to him. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he looks kind of small, honestly, but he has a whole lot of power to him, and you, you got to watch out when he's on fire. It's now McLaughlin on the 0-2. This one's going to be lofted up behind the plate. Count remains. And, you know, a lot of power, too, is something you don't expect from a leadoff guy. You just expect him, you know, just as one of those get-on-base get type of guys. But Scott Holzwasser is different. He has it all at the plate, a complete package, and just been one of the stars for Newport on the whole season. So two offering, fastball, he's going to swing and pop up into the infield. 
Coming in is Lucas from short. And he barely made the catch. It was a circus catch from him. And there's two away down here in the second. Holzwalser, he's got a very close stance when he bats, a very tight one. And so I'm kind of surprised that he's gotten so much power out of it because he really doesn't have too much leverage going into his at bat. Well, it all comes from his his kick that he has that that front foot kicking uh, adds a lot of power. Sonny Uliana obviously is a much much bigger guy, but yes. he has a similar stance actually, and so it all comes from the legs and the hips. That pitch is low and. Nice block from Barry, but moving up on the play into scoring position is Joey Bellini. I mean, Barry's been doing a very solid job of blocking up the balls. Again, he comes in relief for Jamie Taylor, who has to go home. And uh, also Hunsinger, who, who is having some back tightness, really the one to rest up. Uh, if the Schooners go on, maybe we'll see him, maybe we won't. That's just kind of a toss-up right now, but Mike Caruso is still on the injury list. This 1-0 going to be... Swung at from Cavalieri and fouling towards the bullpens, one and one. So in reality, Barry about, about the only guy behind the plate for the Schooners. Yeah, it seems like it is Barry for the rest of the season unless Huntsinger is able to come back for the Schooners. That or maybe Caruso sometime mid this week. As this 1-1 one, one offering misses up, two and one. And that was a big loss for the Schooners. Hunsinger was the starting catcher for the Southern Division All-Stars, and so to not have him in the lineup is definitely a big blow. It was definitely a bat, and it's going to be very well missed. That 2-1 fastball misses outside. Nice at bat here from Cavalieri. Smart at bat with two outs, runners on second and third. Being patient at the plate, waiting for his pitch. He's either going to try to work a walk or drive in a couple of these runs. Yeah, to add that, that one strike that was thrown to him was fouled off, but if he straightened that out, it was a little bit more on time. That would have been gone. This is 3-1 pitch, fastball. He's going to hit this one in the left. Kessinger tracking back, but he's there for out number three. So no runs crossed for the goals in the second. Off of one hit, no errors, and a walk as they leave two stranded. Heading into the third, it's still 2-1 to one Newport here on the NECBL Broadcast Network. Top of the third, 2-1 to one Newport here at Guardians Field. Stephen Off alongside the voice of the Mystic Schooners, Laura Hoover. And Nick Bello, the field reporter of the Newport Goals, as Justice, Justice Burke settles in for Mystic. But before that, I want to send it over to Nick. You're with us here in the booth. There's another game going on for postseason action. What's happening across the league in the Northern Division? Yeah, another game is actually scheduled to start right now. There is uh, a little bit of delay up in Holyoke for Upper Valley, Vermont. Burke shows bunt, lays one down to the third baseline, but foul, 0-1. So that game is scheduled to start at 7 p.m., although it's 7.13 now. We still have no update as to whether that game has gone underway. We'll keep you posted on that one, though. So likely a delay there, which only adds to the suspense of the win-or-go-home game that is the wild card. Yeah, I would hate to be those two teams right now. You're just standing in the dugout, anxious, getting ready to go. And uh, unfortunately, the weather says, just hold on a second. It's Jacob Sack now looking on to Justice Burke on. The 0-1, another fastball swung on and missed beneath the zone, 0-2. And, and that's a tough spot to be in because you're right, they're all fired up, ready to go, and this just might mess with their mentality a little bit and just how the, the regular feel going into a ball game. Oh yeah, absolutely, especially if you're a pitcher. So, so two offering, gonna be chopped over to the third base side, past Jones, Holzwasser with it on the back foot throw. Not gonna be in time, so Burke is aboard with an infield single. And not to mention, most of these guys are probably, you know, taking BP, taking field already, not to mention the pitch is warming up, so you're in danger of going cold. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, not a situation you want to be in for anybody there. I mean, I'm sure the broadcasters, too. Oh, know, the vocal so sorry yeah, for those guys. <laughs> the vocal cords are uh, getting a little cold right now, so you got to warm those up in between. So McGuire settles in for Mystic. On the bright side, both teams have to put up with it, so it's not like one is getting the advantage. Both of them have to come out with a different start than they're used to as that oh, one pitch drops into the zone. McGuire was showing bunt, pulled it back, but it was in there anyways for strike one. It's interesting to see McGuire showing bunt. If you're going to see a guy show bunt, more than likely we'd be Justice Burke, one of the best bunters on the team. We did see that in his first uh, at bat, bunted it foul, but you're not really going to see much success besides Burke. Well, it's probably coming from McGuire's 132 average, and so they want him to at least have a productive out and put Burke into scoring position in a one-run ball game. 
Now this 0-1 offering, fastball swung on and missed at the knees, 0-2. So no bunt there from McGuire, now he finds himself down in this count. But you do have some faithful behind his back to see Barmakian, one of the best hitters on this team, especially when you're trying for him. He's a leadoff guy, he'll get on base. That 0-2 is going to be grounded sharply to Bellini at second, he slides, throws the second for one, throw to first, not in time. So McGuire is aboard on the fielder's choice, but the goals do take out the lead runner on the base pass, and with one away, there's a runner on first now for Mystic. I mean, that still puts in decent territory. You, you, again, you got Barmakian, you got Beam, potentially you got Bowens, and even if Barmakian and Beam go down or another double play situation, the next inning sets well for the top of the order. As the lineup does flip over for the Schooners. First pitch to Barmakian's in there for strike one. Barmakian led off this game with the single to the right side of the infield in between Bellini and Hamilton at second and first. This 0-1 offering, breaking ball going to be chopped that way, but foul. Barmakian is batting 319, but one of the leaders for the Schooners as well with a 449 on base percentage. So you know if someone's going to get on, it's going to be Barmakian and Beam. Now Jacob Sack, another breaking ball, and flailing at it is Barmakian, but it hooks foul towards the bullpens. So the count remains 0-2. That's why I like the, the sacrifice bunt call there from McGuire because it puts you into this situation, but instead of just a runner on first because he nearly grounded out into a double play ball, it would still be an out, but you have a guy in scoring position as the lineup flips over. And that's where you want to be, especially in a one-run ball game. The so 2 pitch swung on and fouled off, but this is a winner go home, and so you're going to see some strategies that you may not see in a normal game because every single run can make a difference. And same thing with every little mistake that you make, that can make a huge difference when, uh, you know, when you're down maybe two or one, one in the ninth. That throw over to first, the wrong side of the bag, so McGuire is back safely. Yeah, so definitely a lot of thinking here for these coaches and these managers here in the playoffs. Now Jacob Sack, righty on lefty matchup against Bormakey, and on the 0-2, gonna be grounded softly towards the left side of the infield. Holzwasser with it, throws to first. Not in time. So a soft infield single, and that will put runners on first and second now for Mystic. And that's a play that I have been seeing Holzwalser make this summer, and I'm honestly very, very proud of Barmakian, able to really chug down the line, put a little bit more heat on but, but behind his back and beat Holzwalser's throw over because Holzwalser, Probably the best shortstop in the NECBL so far. Yeah, he's been the starter for the Southern Division at second base. The goals uh, put him at shortstop recently, and he has not let them down. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised me if he is the best shortstop in the NECBL as that first pitch fastball misses up to David Beam, 1-0. And this just makes David Beam's at bat even more critical. If you're wanting to put McGuire in an even more threatening position out at third base, a double from Beam would give McGuire that opportunity. A single would also give him the opportunity, but more so Beam, a guy liking to go uh, a little bit deeper. This one's going to be chopped over to Jones at 30. Steps on the bag, throw across the diamond, not in time. So another fielder's choice for Mystic. And with two away, there's runners still on first and second. Yes, at the same time, you have T.T. Bowens threatening. He's already hit al alongside Ben Maycock. The deepest ball that we've seen tonight besides the home run ball uh, in, in, in the bottom of the first inning from Hamilton. So these guys are getting contact off of Jacob Zach and really capitalizing on it. Potentially here, if, if you're giving something Bowens or Maycock likes, they're going after it. And there's going to be a meeting on the mound between Colton Bender, the catcher for the goals, and Greg Zacherson, the pitching coach for Newport, probably to talk about how to attack Bowens at the plate. And they are going to have to be careful. We talked about how good he is earlier, but he hasn't actually had the most success here at Cardines. He's 0 for 11 here in Newport, 
with eight strikeouts. But he does do damage against everyone else in the league, even did damage against the goals when they were at Mystic's home field. And so just because he struggles at Cardines doesn't mean uh, he's irrelevant at the plate. He's the star guy in the Schooners lineup. And, and Bowens is one of those guys who has the home run shot with the line drive, not so much uh, the, the the high moon shot. So that's another reason why you're looking for Bowens to, to get the fence ball, really knock it down at, at the edge. Maycock is one of those guys who does like to get to a little bit more pump off the ball, a little bit more air. Jacob Sack is looking on to Bowens. First pitch missed low for ball one. This one's going to be a breaking ball. Chopped over to Jones at third. He snags it off with one hop. Steps on the bag, and that will end things here in the top half of the third. No runs crossed for the Schooners. Off of two hits as they leave two stranded. Heading into the home half. Two to one. Goals on top here on the NECBL Broadcast Network. Bottom of the third. Two to one still. Newport on top. As it's still Trey McLaughlin out there for the Schooners. He's tonight's starter for Mystic, but we talked about how he might have a pitch count around 65 in it, 65 pitches. They might only let him go three innings. So this may be his last out on the mound, but they did try to call Fairfield the other day to see if he could go past that. He is the ace for Mystic, and so they want him to go as long as they can uh, have him out there for this winter go home game as that first pitch to Chris Hamilton misses outside. Fastball for ball one. It also looks like the Schooners do have someone warming up in the pen as well. So you you might see him getting retired as is that uh, Ryan McGlinsky? Number Yeah, tw 23 Ryan McGlinsky would be out there in the bullpen. So pitch was in there for strike one. One and one pitch. Change up swung on and missed from Hamilton beneath the zone. One and two. So more than likely Schooners would be trying to go with the two big guns to, to uh the goal is trying to shut them down, maybe. Is that one two pitch miss low two and two? And yeah, they might try to save shot for tomorrow if Mystic does win this game. Righty on lefty matchup for McLaughlin on the two two fastball missing up. Count now full. Hamilton now is riding that 30 game on base streak after that two run home run he had in the first. That gave the goals their two runs on the day so far and gave them the two to one lead. Now the payoff pitch. Fastball going to be driven right back up the middle. Second hit of the day for Chris Hamilton. And for the second inning in a row, that puts the leadoff man aboard for Newport. And I'm honestly just surprised McGuire didn't chase after the ball. T -t Took a funky hop, but nonetheless, he didn't really go after the, the ground, try and block it up. It was a sharp line drive up the middle, so it would have been a tough play for McGuire, but... That will now bring up Justin Henry Malloy. The runner on first and no outs. First offering to Malloy. Fastball missing outside, 1-0. McLaughlin not having the control that he normally does, so I'm not actually surprised that Ryan McGlinsky warming up in the pen already. You may, you may see Trey get retired early in this inning. That 1-0 breaking ball check swing from Malloy. He didn't go around as it dropped beneath the zone, 2-0. Malloy on the day, one for one. Singled his only plate appearance so far. That was in the first, where he's later caught out on a Brett Vosick fielder's choice. McLaughlin, righty on righty matchup on the 2 0 -oh fastball. Misses up count. Now 3 0, and you have to be careful here because there's a 3 1 count. You gave up the two run shot to Chris Hamilton, but now you have a guy in Justin Henry Malloy who's ahead in this count. He leads the team in home runs. McLaughlin out of the stretch on the 3-0. Fastball misses low. Ball four, his second walk of the day. And McLaughlin comes up limping off the mound. He drops his glove, and you could see him obviously ailing out there. And it looks it will be a call to the pen almost as head coach Phil Orby already coming out to the mound. And generally speaking, he will not come out unless it is a relief and calls him pen. It's either that or they're looking at the injury because McLaughlin came up hurting immediately. Now, this does not count as a mound visit if they are just checking to see if he is okay. They only have two mound visits per inning, but you can have more if there's an injured player out there. As you see, head coach for Mystic, Phil Orby, talking things over with McLaughlin. No sign to the bullpen just yet. 
it almost looked to be something with, with, with his ankle because he, he was stomping on the mound a little bit, trying, trying to, it looks like, to feel it out. Maybe, maybe something with, with his uh, lower body. McLaughlin's going to throw a couple pitches to see if he can go on. It was a good pitch, but you could still see him uh, struggling a little bit out there in some discomfort. Got a few grimaces going on. Yeah, and there's another grimace after that pitch. It does not look great for McLaughlin. The pitches don't look bad, but these warm-up pitches versus in-game pitches can be completely different. They're going to opt to keep him in there. Um, and we're going to see if this is the right call. He's given up a hit in this inning and a walk. He's now given up five hits on the day, including a two-run home run and two walks on the day. And McLaughlin doesn't really walk anybody. Yeah, it's very odd to see him walk two batters already. And if, if, if he was already feeling bad w with these few pitches, you got to wonder, was he feeling bad before the game? And, and, and it's just coming back to uh, kick him. That first pitch fastball to Brett Vosick catches the bottom edge of the zone, 0-1. Yeah, the command just hasn't been there that we're used to from McLaughlin, but also picking up this minor injury might affect him out there on the mound. It's on the 0-1, Vosick watches this breaking ball miss outside, 1-1. So a gutsy call from Coach Orby of the Schooners to keep his starter out there, but if you are McLaughlin, you got to love the confidence your coach has in you. Well, even then, Coach didn't look too happy, but McLaughlin just shook him off and took command back on the mound. This 1-1 one -one is going to be floated into left field. Coming on is Kessinger, and he's there for out number one. And if you're McLaughlin, you're going to be relying heavily on your fielders to help you out, keep your pitch count low, just get out of this inning and, and, and see if an inning of rest will help you out. Yeah, and I think Orby might want to keep him in there just for this inning. We talked about maybe he can only go three today, and so he's in the third. Maybe just see if he could stretch things out a little bit until they have to turn to the pen. But there is one away now for the goals. Colton Bender at the plate with runners on first and second. First offering to Bender. Fastball going to be chopped over to short. Lucas with it on a knee. He drops it. The throw to second, though, is in time. But that will put Colton Bender aboard first. That's a good play by Lucas, getting the quick easy out, even though he did take a little bit of a slip, just getting one out, getting something to help out McLaughlin. So Bender is now aboard for the first time today after that fielder's choice. As now there's runners on the corners for the goals with two away and Hayden Jones at the plate. So righty on lefty matchup for McLaughlin. Last time up, Jones ripped a line drive right back up the middle. McLaughlin looking on out of the stretch. First offering, fastball going to be swung at and tipped behind the plate, 0-1-1. If you're McLaughlin, you're hoping for uh, just one of a few things. Quick, easy strikeout, get it over with the inning, or something soft, so he doesn't have to pitch more balls. Nice, easy ground out. That, that would be the two most ideal places for McLaughlin to land right now. So one pitch, breaking ball swung on and missed from Jones. 0-2, nice breaking ball there from McLaughlin. He has that curveball that could be his put-away pitch, could be the pitch where he need, just needs a strike in that situation, and he's able to get one here against Hayden Jones, who was caught out in front. Now the 0-2, fastball going to be floated into left again. Luke is going back from short, and he's there for out number three. So no runs crossed for the goals in the bottom half of the third off of a hit and a walk. No errors. They leave two stranded. Heading into the fourth, it's still 2-1 Newport here on the NECBL Broadcast Network. Top of the fourth, Newport leads two to one. Here at Cardin, Stephen Up alongside the voice of the Mystic Schooners, Laura Hoover, and the field reporter of the Newport goals, Nick Bello. And since it's the fourth, I'm gonna send it over to my broadcast counterpart, Laura, take it away. Well, thank you, Stephen. We're looking at Ben Maycock, Will Lucas, and Nolan Kessinger to start off this fourth inning of work for the Schooners, still out on the mound, Sam Jacobsack for the goals and so far Schooners have been shut down in the past two innings off of that one run that C Bar Macon was able to play all the way back in the first from a sacrifice from TT Bowens but Schooners still trailing two to one underneath the goals so we'll see how Ben Maycock retaliates. 
Maycock able to fly out into deep or right field last time he was up to the plate in the first inning. So we'll see how it goes around for him here. Resting off against Jacob Sack, the first pitch inside, strike one. And we talked about this being Jacob Sack's second start ever as a Newport goal. Didn't start for Northeastern this spring either. Down opposite field, left field way deep, and it will be a sliding catch coming in from Cavalieri as Maycock thought he was going to go have two for himself. And what a play from Cavalieri. That is a Sports Center top 10 play right there. I mean, driving towards the line, able to slide. He has such great speed, and because of that, that's why he's able to make that play. That's a huge first out for the goals here in the fourth. Especially against the power hitter in Maycock, but we will get Will Lucas now coming up to the plate for the Schooners. Lucas shouldering his bat, awaiting the first pitch, holds on the upstairs ball number one. Of course, we mentioned Jacob Sack, though, in his first, second start here. First start, he went six innings, and he's in his fourth here. I think the goals won five or six out of him today. Well, short chopper by Lucas. He hustles down to first base, but the throw from Jones is in time. Finally, so uh, Lucas grounds out 5-3. That's, that's a play from a catcher playing third base. This is his only second time playing catcher, or third base, excuse me, this summer. He hasn't played third base before. The first time a couple days ago for Newport since high school. Uh, but he able to feel that hop there and throw across the diamond. He looks like a natural. Really does, although the patient player in Nolan Kessinger finds one outside ball one. And Kessinger on the 1-1 one -one count grounded into a very odd play uh, all the way back in the second inning, which was heavily discussed as a swing and a miss brings him to that 1-1 one -one count. Yeah, that was the ball he ripped down the right field side and it bounced off the warehouse. And there was discussion, is that a ground rule double or not? Because it went under some banners they have over there here at Cardians, but they ruled him out on the play because the ball just went in and went out. Well, he does take the 2-1 count. There's a 2-1 pitch uh, just outside, so Kessinger holds on the 3-1. and one. Kessinger, a guy who can also draw the walk, and if, he, if he's able to get on base, that could start generating some stuff for the Schooners as the 3-1 pitch fouled away to a full count to Kessinger. Kessinger awaiting the payoff pitch from Sav Jacob Sack. And he could see something from Jacob Sack on this next pitch. Payoff underway, and Kessinger draws the walk in the first walk from Jacob Sack tonight. Yeah, nice pitch there actually from Jacob Sack. Breaking ball in that count. Tried to catch Kessinger on the back door, but. Just missed outside, and that's the first walk for Jacob Sack. But I like that pitch, and I think he's going to go to that pitch later on. If he can just work it a little bit more into the zone, it'll be deadly against the Schooners, yeah, for that, sure. Yeah, that backdoor slider can be a dangerous pitch. And Kessinger caught sleeping at first base will be picked off. So Schooners go an unconventional three up and three down. We're heading to the home half with Bellini, Thomas, and Holzwalzer due up in order in the NECBL Broadcast Network. Fans, the NECBL Broadcast Network. Ryan McLinsky coming to the hump for the Mystic Schooners. The number two pitcher out of Pearl River, New York in Seton Hall University. The junior stands at 6-2 on the mound with a 4.23 ERA. He's got two wins, no loss, and no saves. He's pitched 34 innings with 39 strikeouts, 14 walks, and 41 hits off of him. He has seen seven starts out of eight games appeared, and this will be only his second time mid-relief for the Schooners. We'll see how he does up against the Newport goals. He's only pitched once against Newport in three and two-thirds innings. Uh, gave up three runs, five hits, two walks, and four strikeouts out of 18 batters face. So he's coming in pretty heavy, although that was fairly early in the season, and he has since progressed for Mystic. So that will close the book on the starter for the Mystic Schooners here today, Trey McLaughlin. He went three innings pitched, gave up two runs, both of them earned, and that was off the Chris Hamilton two-run shot in the first. Gave up five hits and two walks on the day. 
to just one strikeout. So a very uncharacteristic day for Trey McLaughlin. We will see pitch number one to Joseph Bellini as strike one as McLaughlin painting the lower half of the zone tonight, looks to be. His fastball hit on and going under the David Beam at the fence, has to come back out, but it goes over. Another home run for the Newport Goals. And that's Bellini's third home run of the season. He had one last time out against Winnipesaukee. We know he has a lot of power. He's feeling it lately. He has another one here today. And the goals now lead three to one. McLaughlin had a little short chopper on the outside third of the zone and Bellini capitalized it. He didn't look like he had too much power behind it, but it just barely drops over the fence. The yeah. bats are hot here in Newport. How about that home run for Joseph Bellini? They had five the other night against Winnipesaukee. Now they have two here today. And we're just in the top, bottom half of the fourth. It's now Isaiah Thomas as he takes a strike right down the heart of the plate. The 0-1 count and McClinsky trying to work the lower part of the zone. Next pitch delivered just inside the dirt, the 1-1 count. And to get that leadoff home run against Ryan McClinsky, who just came into the game that does huge things for the goals moving forward, talking about their momentum in this one, might rattle McClinsky on the mound too as you see him missing at some of his spots here against Isaiah Thomas. Yeah, Thomas holding on some of those outside pitches from McClinsky. A guy who likes to paint the corner with that slider takes another fastball, missing just inside and three and one to Thomas. And you're facing some big guns if you're Ryan McGlinsky, not one of the guys who necessarily likes to come out of the pen, but will do so if needed. Broken bat single over the head of McGuire will have a base hit for Isaiah Thomas. Yeah, that bat absolutely shattered from Thomas and you saw him not even running out of the batter's box as he thought maybe McGuire might be able to make a play on that one. So he was actually watching the bat as well. It jumped over McGuire though and so Thomas is aboard with his first hit of the day as the lineup flips over for Newport. Yeah, I think he saw the dollar signs go away with all that with that bat. That's why he stopped for a second. But uh, nonetheless, a good hit from Isaiah Thomas. That bat shattered into multiple pieces, that's for sure. <laughs> Well, Scott Holzwalser now coming up has yet to reach base on a ground out and a pop out. Facing off against Ryan McGlinsky. One on, no away, takes one at the letters and strike one. And what we're seeing from Newport is exactly why they've been one of the best teams in the NECPL on the season. You have production from the top and middle half of your order, but also at the bottom half of the order. It's such a well-balanced team. The bottom three guys in this lineup all have hits. Joey Bellini, of course, with the home run in this inning. And to have that production throughout the whole lineup it just makes you such a complete team and there's no easy outs uh, for the opposing pitchers. That is very much true in the case of the two pitches for the Schooners and McLaughlin and McGlinsky. Another one fouled away and the 0-2 count and forces Thomas to return to first base. Yeah, you saw Thomas going on the play. He has 11 steals on the year for the goals, second on the team. And he's the guy that arrived late from Vanderbilt, who won the College World Series. So to have that many steals at that short amount of time is impressive. He's by, by far the fastest Newport goal. The 0-2 pitch to Holzwalser, taken just high, and the 1-2 now drawn up. Holzwalser, a good eye on the pitch. McClinsky gets set. Takes a look over at Thomas. The one-two pitch, nice short chopper. Here is Barmakian McGuire, Bowens, but will he get the tag? I really could not see there. No, it, the throw to first was not in time, and so Scott Holzwasser is aboard now with that fielder's choice. And that's such a benefit for the goals because you have that speed at the bottom and top end of the lineup that if you do hit a weak grounder like that, it's almost impossible to double them up. Yeah, the uh, glove of TTU Bowens and the umpire are just out of my sight, so could, could be a little bit hairy for me calling plays out there. As Ryan McLinsky, a pickoff attempt at Scott Holzwalser, who was finally able to reach first base tonight. He's back in plenty of time, though, as 
Greg Cavalieri looking to join the traffic on the bases. Throw from Bowens, and again, back in time. They're trying to get a pickoff of their own. They're keeping an eye on Holzwasser because we just mentioned his speed. He has eight stolen bases on the year. It's tied for third on the Newport, Newport team, and he is a threat to go at any point. He is a good base runner. Cavalieri, the runner almost going, although blocked up by Barry, has Holzwasser returning back to first base. Yeah, you saw the fake steal on there from the Newport goals, Holzwasser acting like he was going to go, and it rushed Barry behind the plate. You saw him trying to get the ball out in a hurry, and it, he ended up dropping it. Miklinski with the pitch. Nice deep ball from Cavalieri coming in is David Beam. We'll check the runner, making sure that McGuire has it safely in his glove, and there's two away. So if you're Newport with two outs, it's not the end of the world because the next two up have been the most successful hitters on the day for the goals. Chris Hamilton, two for two with two, a two-run home run. And then Justin Henry Malloy following him with a single and a walk. So it's a great opportunity just to get some two-out hitting going and maybe tack on another run here in the fourth. Chris Hamilton, huge hitter tonight, facing off against Ryan McGlinsky. McGlinsky yet again throwing to Bowens to check Holzwalser at first base. And I understand they're trying to keep an eye on Holzwasser, but two outs, I think that's too risky of a play at this point because if Holzwasser goes, you could just try to catch him stealing, but you're risking an errant throw at first that could put him on third if that happens. McClinsky throw from Barry to Will Lucas. The tag down gets him, so now three away. We're heading into the fifth inning and bring up the bottom of the order, Barry, Burke, and McGuire on the NECBL Broadcast Network. I'll bring on up Shemis, Barry, Justice, Burke, and Josh McGuire. It's the NACBL broadcast now. We're got Laura Hoover alongside the voice of the Newport Goals and Stephen Huff. And we are about to rock and roll into the top half of the fifth inning. Schooners trail goals now 3-1. to one. Seamus Barry Dua facing off against Sam Jacobsack going into his fifth inning of work. Barry. Waiting the first pitch, delivered upstairs and takes ball one. You gotta like the day that Jacob Sachs had on the mound so far. They just wanna throw him out there and get out. He's only given up four hits on the day, one walk. Been able to really limit these Mystic Schooners base runners. And aside from the leadoff man, Steve Barmakian scoring in the first, no one's been around for Mystic. You can see Jacob Sachs settling into a groove. As Barry fouls one away off of the 2-0 pitch, make that the 2-1 now as he was working fairly well in both at-bats, getting two straight balls before fouling them away and not able to capitalize on anything so far. Struck out in his last at-bat in the second inning. Here's the 2-1 pitch in same situation, make it the 2-2 pitch. Yeah, nice change up there from Jacob Sack, able to catch Barry out in front. Jacob Sack's been pounding the fastballs all day and so start to expect to see that change up a little bit more often. Barry has to really duck out of the way and will draw the full count as the inside pitch almost hits him at the knees. The short move away brings Barry into a tight spot with the payoff pitch underway. Holds and will draw the walk and that's the second walk that we've seen from Jacob Sack tonight and start to wonder, is he getting a little bit tired out there? Yeah, it's second in a row. Now, he battled back in that count well um, but you always do wonder, uh, you know, a reliever out there that's not used to starting and going longer innings on the mound, if he is feeling uh, some fatigue at this point. But they had him go six against New Bedford, so they know he can uh, go a little bit deeper than just here in the fifth. Well, that brings up Justice Berg. We saw him reach base back in the third inning, takes one inside, and there is ball one. And Berg, like we mentioned before, one of the best bunters for the Schooners team. Although at this point, Skinners just need to get men on base and really work a little bit of small ball. As he has a short drive into Bellini, fielding to Hamilton. That will be out number one, although Moose Shame is Barry up 90 feet. Yeah, Barry in the scoring position now is just a soft enough ground ball where the really only other play to make is at first base. Bellini fielded it well and got the out, but now Jacob Sack, you have to be a little bit careful because even though you have McGuire, the nine-hole hitter who 
not hitting that well on the season. Next up is Steve Barmaki in the top of the order for the Schooners. McGuire reaching on that fielder's choice. Again, back in the third inning. Awaits the first pitch, pops it foul. McGuire, a guy, swings on the early fastball, any kind that he'll get. So he has learned a little bit of patience so far this summer. Worked back up his batting average to 132. Shoulders his bat, awaiting the 0-1 pitch from Jacob Sack. It's just over his shoulder at second. The throw inside will hold Barry at second and draw McGuire to the 1-1 count. Yeah, you can see Jacob Sack just relying on his fastball right now. The fatigue might be kicking in or he might be a little bit frustrated. And because of that, Colton Bender, now the catcher for the goals, is out to talk to his pitcher on the mound. And it really could be a, a combination of, of both. Both yeah. pitchers really haven't necessarily found their, their hard-hitting mark tonight. Jacob Sack really worked the second inning finding it, but ever, ever since then has, has let, let up a batter here, let up a batter there. Yeah, Jacob Sack, the command isn't always in the zone, at least in the last couple of batters, but uh, I expect him just to find his rhythm on the mound, calm down a little bit, and go back to the pitcher that we've been used to seeing all day. McGuire just trying to get on base and set at the top of the order for the Schooners. Skies one in the center field, coming back. Bellini looks like he'll be able to make the field and will force Seamus Berry still at second. So two away, bringing up Steve Barmakian. Yeah, tough play there for Bellini. You saw him not running sideways or anything, just straight backtracking from uh, what would be the middle of the bag all the way back to straightaway center. And it was a major league pop-up, and he was able to eventually glove it. But that's one of those where everyone in the stadium is holding their breath. Yeah, definitely some, some nice backpedaling skills there by Bellini. I mean, that's why you practice that kind of stuff. You never know what's going to happen. But uh, I mean, he's been practicing it, clearly. He is a middle infielder uh, by trade, a shortstop naturally. And so with that comes the quick feet that you expect. Although a soft grounder to Bellini will force Barmakian now, and yet again, Schooners leave one aboard on a walk. No hits, no runs, and no errors. We're going bottom half of the fifth. Hamilton Malloy Vosick on the NECBL Broadcast Network. The NECBL Broadcast Network, Chris Hamilton, Justin Henry Malloy, and Brett Vosick do up in order. And it will be Ryan McGlinsky to face off against them, who stands up on the rubber for the Schooners. It's 3-1, goals on top of the Schooners in the home half of the fifth. Hamilton, the guy who's been able to reach two times, so far on a home run and a single, yet to be retired at the plate. Facing off against McGlinsky, first pitch outside, ball one. McGlinsky going into his second inning of work, saw already a home run off him to start off the fourth. McGlinsky shaking off a sign from Barry, takes one inside, and there's ball number two. Yeah, it looked to be two straight sliders to start this at bat against Chris Hamilton, which isn't a bad approach. You want to throw those breaking balls, especially against a guy like Hamilton who has been hot at the plate. You don't want to give him a fastball because he's shown you can, he can beat you with it. Fouled away and the one, or the, the two and oh pitch becomes two and one. Hamilton still working ahead of the count from McClinsky. Fun to watch both of Trey and Ryan pitch back to back as one taken away outside as Ryan McGlinsky uh, sweating a little bit. Yeah, we talked about McLaughlin and McGlinsky, even Schaaf being, you know, the top three pitchers in the Schooner staff. Drives, unable to field as well. Lucas and yet another man able to reach first base who leads off. And so we expected it, you know, to be strength against strength, the top three guys for the Schooners. We're going to see two of them here today against the hot Newport goals bat. But so far, the goals have been all over the Schooners. That right there is... The sixth hit of the day comes in, coming in the fifth inning. The goals also have two home runs on the day. And it just seems like the goals, you're continuing that trend at the plate. This is exactly when you want to catch fire. Shouldering his bat, Justin Henry Malloy has been retired both times. Actually out on the base pass, able to reach twice as well, take strike one. 
Very interesting plays to get out Henry Malloy as he has the 0-1 pitch. McClinsky to deliver. Hands set at the belt. Awaiting the pitch is Malloy, the throw. Slow roller, but just outside in the 1-1 count. Yeah, Malloy, one of those guys that, I know you tried the breaking balls against Chris Hamilton, now you're trying it against Malloy because you have to be careful with what you give them, but pitch like that, Malloy's just not gonna offer at. Leads the team in walks and just has the best feel for the zone. Ryan McGlinsky pitches to Malloy, pops it up, going back, David Beam is at the wall. That's a backtrack off the wall, and that one will be a double going around to score. Will be a Chris Hamilton from first base. A double for Justin Henry Malloy. Yeah, Malloy gets his seventh double of the season, and it's able to score Hamilton all the way from first, and it's just this middle part of the order that's been clicking for the goals. Now all three times for each, Hamilton and Malloy, up at the plate, they've been able to reach base safely. That's Six times those two have been on base, absolutely slugging the ball as well. Now the goals lead four to one. And Beam out there in center field trying to track it, but it, he loses it in the signs as, as it bounces off top of the wall, essentially. So, with none away, bring up Brett Vosick. Vosick now seeing a one man on, none away, and Seamus Berry going out to talk to his pitcher. Yeah, and I think that's a good call if you're Seamus Barry. He gave up, if you're McGlinsky, a home run last inning and then a single immediately after that. This inning, gave up a single and a double to lead off this one. Just need to calm him down out there on the mound, just throw his normal pitches. Nothing changes right here uh, if you're McGlinsky. You just need to get out. Well, Seamus Barry behind the plate awaiting McGlinsky's first pitch. Swing on and missed, and Vosick is already behind the count. Oh, and what? Yeah, and it's the breaking ball once again from McGlinsky. That's been his go-to pitch. The goals haven't been able to hit it. Um, a lot of them are sitting fastball right now, and you saw it work for Malloy and Hamilton. Now Vosick down in the count 0-1. Takes one inside, Barron able to block it up, and on the wild pitch will move up. Justin Henry and Malloy threatening even more. Yeah, and with this game being a three-run game right now, and and it's a win or go home. You have to be as clean as possible defensively. And that's just a wild pitch for Mystic. It helps the goals out now. Malloy 90 feet from extending their lead. So Vosik with a 1-1 count. Waiting the pitch. Delivers. Cuts just outside and the 2-1 and one count. And you know, something I'm noticing from these goals players right now is they're just waiting for a good pitch to hit and they are capitalizing on that opportunity. The 2-1 pitch to Vosick. Miklinski set the leg kick, the delivery. Looks to be off the bat and foul territory, so it knots it up at two apiece. Yeah, might have been off the knob of Vosick's bat there, and so a little bit unlucky for him because there's a pitch that was riding inside as he was charging his swing, but it came in and just tipped the bat, and so that's a free strike for Miklinski. So McGlinsky working at the knotted count of two apiece, gets set, hands at the belt, the look down to home, the throw, and that catches just on Vosick's zone. The first away on strikeouts looking and bring up Colton Bender. Yeah, it's the breaking ball once again with two strikes there from McGlinsky, and it broke just perfectly into the zone at the last second. Vosick, uh, you can't discredit him there at that at-bat. And there'll be uh, pitching coach Dennis Long coming to talk to his pitcher in McLinsky. I don't necessarily think we're going to see McLinsky re get retired in this inning. I uh, would put a little bit more faith. Maybe we'll see someone come in the seventh. Yeah, we talked about at the top of the broadcast how Mystic's going to throw their top guys out there, and McLinsky's one of them. They're going to want to get some innings out of him because McLaughlin only went three. So maybe until yeah, the sixth or seventh inning until you see another Schooners pitcher, unless McGlinsky uh, gets into some trouble. I would assume it will be Peter Myers coming in relief as well, the, the top mid-reliever for the Schooners. Although, let's go back to Colton Bender awaiting his first pitch from Ryan McGlinsky. Delivers one, just low in ball one. Yeah, and it's interesting that, you know, I, I would almost think about too if you're Mystic Tyler Schaaf out there because he was an all-star and I know you got to worry about tomorrow, but 
there is no tomorrow if you don't win today. And so you almost have to throw your best arms, especially in this situation. The throw from McLinsky held on, but it called strike either way for the 1-1 count to Bender. You could risk it. You definitely could risk it. I mean, it, and I don't even see it as a big risk either because if the Schooners don't win, like I said, their season's over. And then you're thinking, what well, would have happened if we would have thrown our number two guy out there? Outside, blocked up by Barry. Not enough time for Malloy to take over at home, and that will be the 2-1 count to Bender. And I talked to Kevin Winterrow, the, the head coach for the goals, about the pitching today, and he said, we're just going to throw ev everyone if they're available. There is no limit. We're just going to put them out there because we need to win today. And I like that mindset. I like that mentality. And you put Jacob Sack out there, even though he's not a typical starter, he's doing a great job tonight. And I expect, you know, the goals just to turn to their best arms the rest of the way. And tomorrow could be a throwaway game as well if you need to get some guys day off. Out of a three-game series as well as that one's fouled into the street behind us and now the 2-2 count to Bender. Yeah, against the Vineyard, I don't expect it to be a throwaway game per se because a three-game series, it's the playoffs. That gets you into the championship. So you don't want to treat any game like a throwaway game. Uh, but, but if you do throw all of your starters, you, you almost have to throw a bullpen game. Well, I think that's where the goals have an advantage because they have such a deep pitching staff that Dylan Brown, who's the scheduled starter for tomorrow, likely won't have to be turned on here tonight because you have other valuable arms. Popped into deep right field. Here comes in. Maycock, the throw to home. Will be a time. No, gets by him. McClinsky actually covers, though. So one run scoring in as two away. Yeah, that's what you want. I mean, it's it's a close game, 4-1 ball game. You have a runner on third with one away. Take the productive out if you're the goals. Trust Malloy's speed on third, and it works out for them. The productive out turns into another run. The second in this inning, the goals now lead 5-1. to one. I don't think the throw would have beaten the runner in any case, but a good block up by McClinsky covering the backstop. Coming up. Jones as he fouls one away on the first pitch he sees. Down in the count, 0-1. And, and we're talking about the mentality of how to use pitchers in this one game playoff, but I think how to hit as well. We're seeing a lot more aggressive base pass. We're seeing some bunts to get guys in scoring position and sacrifice flies. flies. Uh, they might not normally you know, expect to see in these situations because it's so early on. Maybe not the sacrifice fly, but the bunting earlier especially. Um, but because it's win or go home, you're pulling out all the stops, trying to get as many runs as possible. The 0-2 count to Jones. McGlinsky, the pitch outside, and that brings the 1-2. And this is where I start to normally see Schooners start coming alive on the hitting side as well. They're kind of a back half team when it comes to hitting, so look for the 6 to kind of work things around and really come alive in the 7th. Dropped in, tipped away, throw from Byers to Bowens, and that will be a strikeout for Jones and three away. So as the goals lead now 5-1 and pulling away from the Schooners, we're going into the 6th inning of work. Beam, Bowens, make cock and order on the NECBL Broadcast Network. Frank. Well, bring up Beam, Bowens, and Maycock on the NACBL Broadcast Network as the Schooners now trail 5-1. to one. And we are with the sixth inning of work. And Jacob Sack still up on the hump. Getting set. David Beam facing off against Jacob Sack. Pitch inside, almost gets his jersey in. That is the 1-0 count to Beam. Yeah, and so the command might be lacking a little bit from Jacob Sack here in the sixth. You're extending a reliever as far as you can, but a good sign for the goals. First of all, you're saving some arms at this point. You still have a four-run lead, but that fastball has just as much velocity as we saw in the first inning. Beam holding as one, taken low, and he now is ahead of the count with a 2-0 pitch. So you saw a peek into the goals' bullpen. It's Mike Sansone warming up for Newport. And here Beam awaits the next pitch in from Jacob Sack taken just upstairs and 3-0. and And at this point, Beam might be holding on the next pitch. Yeah, I expect a hold from Beam. You're starting to see Jacob Sack have a couple of walks and now they count 3-0 and to lead off this inning. You need a base runner on, so Beam is probably holding at the plate. 
finds one in the zone and draws the three and one. And that's the location you want if you're Jacobs. That fastball low and away. A great pitch. Even if Beam is swinging, it's just going to be a, a routine play for the infield behind Jacobs. Well, Beam holds yet again but draws the full count. So a full count already written up for Beam, who has yet to take the bat off his shoulder. And at this point, Beam's got to be fighting for his spot on first base as the payoff pitch from Jacob Zach going to be underway here. Beam with his bad shoulder leading off with the Schooners. Nice hop back to Jacob Zach, and he will have a soft toss over to Hamilton and one away. Yeah, and that's a great play for the goals. If that gets over, it's going to be a tough play for Holzwasser or Bellini behind the bag at second or around the bag. So Jacob Sack, you see how tall he is on the mound, and he's able to leap up and make the play throw to first in time. It's a big out for the goals. Now just one away in the sixth. It does bring up T.T. Bowen's a line out back in the third and a fly out already tonight. Also a nice drop from Jacob Sack. Falling behind 3-0 in that count, able to battle back, forced to ground out. Bowen's a very soft chop in the infield grass. The misplay by Jones will land Bowen's on first base. And he will get a infield hit. And put on up Ben Maycock. Yeah, that ball was so softly hit that you even wonder with Bowen's running down first if there would have been a play or if he would have been out. It would have been a close one, but uh, we're going to give the credit to Bowen's on that one. It's just off the end of Jones's glove. And Sets up the double play now for Jacob Sack on the mound, which is what you want in this situation to get you out of the sixth in a hurry. Although Ben Maycock threatening pretty good here. Two deep fly balls already tonight. Takes a few swings before enters into the box. Awaiting the first pitch in from Sam Jacob Sack again, going into his sixth inning of work. Here's Maycock winning his first pitch as delivered outside, ball one. Bowen's also a threat to the base paths. Not too many stolen bases, but he's got the speed to hustle around if Maycott gives him anything good. Jacob Sack shaking off a sign from Bender. Waiting the pitch. Maycock steps back in. Here's Jacob Sack. The 1-0 pitch. Delivery in the same spot outside. Yeah, and if you're Jacob Sack, you're going to want to little, work a little bit lower in, in the zone on this one. You've forced two ground balls into the infield the last two at-bats, and so just stick with what you're doing. He's missing a little bit on the outside, uh, half a little bit, and that might be because of the fatigue reasons. Swing and a miss will put Maycock uh, still ahead of the count, although a little bit more close ties with the 2-1. But they're also trying to somewhat pitch around Maycock because you talked about the power that he has. We've seen it with those two big flyouts. So you have to be careful with Maycock at the plate if you're Jacob Sack on the mound. So when he's missing, it's not by much at this point, And that might just be because of the man at the plate. Well, Will Lucas on deck is Maycock receiving the 3-1 pitch, which is arguably, if you're up by 5-1, to one, putting Maycock on first and bringing up the Part of the order where, which hasn't been producing too many base runners might be a better advantage. 3-1 pitch, cut on a miss, and draw Maycock's full count. Yeah, that's not a bad idea, but you know, Maycock himself is 0 for 2, and I think Jacob Sack, with how competitive out there on the mound he is, uh, I think he's just going to want to attack anyone that comes up against him. And so no surprise that he's battling back here. Pops it up, and Bones will have to hold as... Holzwalser trying to chip back in. Great makes the catch, and that puts two away for the Schooners. And this is such a high IQ play from Holzwasser. If we get to get a replay on this, this ball is a major league pop-up. He's calling for the ball right away, but you see him go more towards the left field line so then he could come back to his glove side to get the out. Instead of trying to just settle underneath it from the get-go, Trying to at least go glove side in rhythm when the ball's coming down is a brilliant move because then if Bowens is off the back, he, he can throw it. He, he could do a lot with it. Smart, smart play from Holzwasser. Pick up attempt at first yet again has Bowens holding. And when you see a lot of those major league pop-ups, you see guys trying to get directly underneath it. And that's when the ball starts to swirl in the air and you lose it a little bit. And then next thing you know, it's landing by you and everyone in the crowd is gasping. So 
That is why that play by Holzwasser is so brilliant. TT Bones with the stolen base will be going for two on the knocks himself off. He'll actually be holding at third base. He was gonna go for home, but the throw in from Thomas cuts him off at the plate. Yeah, you saw we talked about maybe you know teams were gonna have to be aggressive on the base pass, especially the schooners trailing a little bit, so they send Bowens, but ball got away. You saw Thomas bobble it too, but he was a little bit slower out there. Um, because he trusted his arm, he has the best arm in the team. So to send Bowens around the third base to home, he would have been gunned down at the plate, so Bowens had to book it back to third. Now, although he has the strongest arm on the team, you know, you got to get the ball in faster than that. That hesitation right there could have possibly cost them a run. And you, you just got to be smarter than that. I don't mind it that much because I think it almost baited Mystic into sending Bowens at to the plate and you saw the throw. It was on a line, it had him beat by half the base path. Uh, I think with Thomas out there, that's the one guy you're okay with how he fielded it. But I do understand your point because I think with anyone else, you might start thinking, hey, you need to get that in a little bit quicker. But with a guy like Thomas, I think you trust him out there because it almost resulted in an out. So that will be a stolen base and advance from second to third on the error from Bender. And if this is the regular season, I don't mind that play right there from Thomas, but I'm just saying because it's the playoffs and because there's so much on the line, even though you have a 5-1 lead, you know, there's very minimal room for error, for error right there. And I think that right there could have caused some errors potentially. Will Lucas does have the 0-1 count, skies it into center left, center right field. Coming underneath it, however, will be Brett Vosick. And Scooters go down yet again without plating a run. We're going to the home after the six in the bottom of the order on the NECBL Broadcast Network. Ryan McGlinsky up on the mound for the Mystic Scooters. Yet again, he's going into his third inning of work and facing the bottom of the order with Bellini, Thomas, and Holzwalser the very part of the order which he had trouble with the first time around. Bellini with that home run off of the second pitch he saw from McGlinsky as goals still lead 5-1. Yeah, and I think we talked about it earlier, but this is just so important for the goals to have that production all throughout the lineup. McGlinsky able to drop one into the zone 0-1. And, and so to have McGlinsky come into this game and then run into trouble against the bottom half of the lineup, it just bodes well for the goals moving forward. Same spot 0-2. And, and here, Joseph Bellini facing off against Ryan McGlinsky, who's trying to rebound from the first two innings of the pitch. Swung on and missed, and he'll be going down swinging. One away, and the Schooners finally able to retire that leadoff man. Yeah, first time they've retired the leadoff man since the first inning, but it's trending up for the Schooners. McGlinsky now three strikeouts on the day, back-to-back -back strikeouts as well. You're down 5-1 to one if you're Mystic, so you need those big outs. You need some of those punch outs. You need to limit base runners, so an ideal start for the Schooners here in the bottom of the sixth. McGlinsky. Pitches one in the same spot, although it's hit on. Fouled away, however, from Isaiah Thomas. And if you're Minklinski, getting all the help that you can get and working the zone would be the perfect situation. The throw, cut on a missed, and that is exactly where Barry called for it. Yeah, and that's a still a dangerous pitch because it's fastball up, and Thomas is able to catch up to it, he's gonna get that one a ride, but because McClinsky has such a live fastball, he's able to blow up by him for strike two. The 0-2 count, right down the middle, the same spot, and two quick away for McClinsky. Yeah, and he goes back to the fastball once again on the 0-2, Thomas can't lay off, and he catches him swinging at a pitch above the zone. A good call there from Barry behind the plate, and now McClinsky with three strikeouts in a row to this inning. McClinsky working very effectively, looking like he's found some rhythm with the bottom of the order. Now Holzwalser takes one upstairs inside, and there is ball number one. So any attempt for an immaculate inning from McClinsky thrown into the wind. The 1-0 pitch down the middle, fouled away the 1-1 to Holzwalser. 
Last time Oluswasa was on, he reached on a fielder's choice. That was also with two outs, and so they sent him stealing. But I, I like to call here, you know, with him at the plate, just able to battle at the plate. Now one dropping outside, two and one the count. McClinsky for the first time this inning working behind the count, although Holzwalser doesn't mind it. He's got some room to give. McClinsky had another high ball, three and one. And it's just the breaking ball that's not snapping into the zone like McGlinsky would like. And uh, he's now in a dangerous situation. It's another three one count and it's the Scott Holzwasser, one of the best hitters on the goals team. McGlinsky with the pitch inside and he will draw the walk. So one aboard on two men away and bring on up Greg Cavalieri who threatens heavily for the goals. Yeah, and so two outs once again for the goals with the runner on first and Scott Holzwasser. And this is one of those situations where it's okay to be a little bit more aggressive on the base pass because if you get a stolen base, you get a runner in scoring position, then a hit's going to score him. And it, it, a one hit with two outs isn't that far-fetched. But uh, if you're trying to bring him around from first with a couple of hits with two outs, that's where it gets a little bit tougher. Well, here's Ryan McGlinsky facing with Greg Cavalieri. Short, looks like to be a broken bat. Blooper, T.T. Bowens fields and three away. And finally, able to retire the side without a run. And plated schooners going in the seventh. Down 5-1 on the NECBL Broadcast Network. Schooners coming back to the plate with Nolan Kessinger to lead off. But it is seventh inning, so taking you the rest of the way here tonight, here is Stephen Hoff, the voice of the Newport Goals. Yeah, and there's a new pitcher on the mound for the goals. It's Mike Sansone, the southpaw from Fairfield. On the season so far, he's had 13 appearances for the goals with a 2.78 ERA. He's thrown 32 and a third's innings pitched, giving up 11 runs, just 10 of them earned off of 32 hits and five walks. He has 31 strikeouts in those 32 and one-thirds pitch. And we're talking 31 strikeouts to five walks. That's what makes him so effective. He has a nice breaking ball, can work inside on righties. Doesn't have that intimidating stature on the mound, but uh, by looking at his pitches and his results, it's all the same. Yeah, by, by this point it really is, and the Scooters order is gonna have a tough time up against him, and especially with the productive order with Kessinger, Barry, and Burke do up. Schooners looking to try to get their bats working here really quickly. So it is the seventh inning. Stephen Huff joined alongside the voice of the Mystic Schooners, Laura Hoover, but we're also joined in the booth by a special guest once again. It's Rick Lombardi. The, you're the head of the grounds crew here at Newport, and uh, you make an annual appearance into the booth every single year, and this is your time. It's a great time in playoff baseball. It is a great time. This is a special time of year, and uh, this is where the, the rubber meets the road. You know, it's do or die, you're in or you're out. So this first either. offering to Kessinger is going to be popped up to the third base side in foul territory. Jones is giving chase. He's there for out number one. And of course, it is do or die. It's so much intensity in this game. I know, uh, obviously, you're the grounds, you head of the grounds crew. You're taking care of the field before and during the game. But you're also a fan. I see you behind home plate hanging out with the general manager and president of the Newport Goals, Chuck Pava, uh, rooting on the team, watching the game. And, Take us through your day, what, what it's like uh, here at Cardinals. Well, we get to the park, you know, uh, usually around 4, 4.30, and uh, we basically our, our job starts uh, once the, they stop taking batting practice, and it's time to get this field ready. And um, she's a, a great field and 100 years old, and I'll tell you, um, it's, it's a pleasure and a, and a, uh, a privilege uh, to work on this field. I mean, you know, Babe Ruth played here and Lou Gehrig and the old Negro League teams and Satchel Page. I mean, the history here is just uh, incredible and um, it's just our privilege to make it look great and get it ready for this, the best talent in college baseball. Yeah, and you guys do such a great job with it too. How about some of those days that are a little bit tougher to deal with the field? You know, the, the Ocean State game a couple weeks ago where it suspended the game. What do you do in a big storm like that? How do you prep the field? How do you deal with the field? It, the field only takes so much. And it only takes so much rain. So, I mean, you really have to get it ready and get it going ahead of time. And if you don't beat it, then you're done. Um, one of the things they do is they'll put uh, the top uh, over the field um, if they know there's rain coming in the forecast. And... Uh, 
they'll keep it as dry as possible. This field drains well, and so it can take a lot of rain, but after a while, it's just so much. So you just got to let Mother Nature kind of dictate what happens is basically what it is. Yeah, sometimes you're handcuffed by Mother Nature, you and there's are. nothing you could do about it. But seeing how you guys uh, balance that and are able to control the field, it's been impressive all this year. I mean, you guys put in more work than anybody. There's a system to it. And, you know, there's some of us that have been here a long time. I've been doing this for 16 years. It's a labor of love for me. And I tell everybody it's my therapy. <laughs> <laughs> it's my place where I can come and not worry about anything. Yeah, you're, you're out there kind of, you know, with, with your crew, and you're able to just yeah. zone in on the work. Uh, that is a good therapy session and, for you. And I love baseball. I mean, I'm just a baseball fan. While I'm a huge Red Sox fan, I love baseball. And this is some of the, like I said, some of the best college talent in, uh, in America that come to the NECBL. And we're so lucky every year um, to see these kids and how they progress. And some of them make it to the major leagues. And it's pretty cool. Well, Sansone did catch Barry looking on a breaking ball, four strike three. So there's two away here in the top of the seventh. He's facing off against Justice Burke. So I have to say, before we go too far, I want to give a shout out. I got a text earlier tonight. Uh, Kevin Long, our former pitching coach here for, for many years, and his wife, his beautiful wife Candy, are listening to the game tonight down in Lakeland, Florida. And they wanted to give a shout out to everybody. And, uh, you know, obviously they're wishing the Gulls the best. And um, Kevin and, and Candy uh, have a special place in their heart for, for the Gulls. I know they do. So just a shout out to them. And who better to get the shout out from than Rick Lombardi, who also, you know, a special place in the goals heart, and you have a special place in your heart for the Newport goals. But you were telling me a little bit uh, a couple days ago about how this field used to play. It was in 2001. There wasn't these 28 feet high fences. It was actually no. a little bit shorter out there. It was, it was shorter, and um, they, they added uh, a section of fence from left field uh, to uh, right center. And... Um, this was a home run ballpark back then. I mean, the ball would fly out of here. And then when they raised the fences to keep some of the balls from hitting the houses and breaking windows and, and the like, um, it turned it into a doubles ballpark, really. It really did. I mean, and vis-a-vis, -vis, we, we lead the league in doubles, I believe, don't we? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so it's because of that park. If you've been paying attention to the Newport games. You've seen the trees that come in as it cut out, especially yeah. in left field. Right. That missing link is that extra link that where everything was raised Correct. after that 2001 season. As this right. one's also popped up into the infield. Holzwasser now just teetering on the left field grass. And he's there for out number three. So three up, three down for the Schooners here in the seventh. We're going to keep it here during stretch time to talk to Rick Lombardi a little bit more. Of course, you've been with the goals for, for quite some time now. Talk about you know what you love so much uh, about being with this team and what you've seen from this team over the years. Aside from the baseball, the, the goals, it's a family thing. You know, I mean, my kids came here when they were little, and, you know, they, they grew up with the goals. We hosted a, a goal for a, for a season, um, and we hosted, uh, you know, a coach for a season there. And, um, but it's the family atmosphere. It's a place in Newport where you can bring your kids and not have to worry about them. And, um, you know, like right now, you know, they're all standing up singing, take me out to the ballpark. And it's, it's about a family venue. And whether it's with the host families or with all of us as volunteers, um, Chuck and, and, uh, and his crew, all the owners, um, make you feel like you're part of their family. And I think you bring up a great point there. I'm, I'm from the Midwest. A lot of listeners know that from Omaha, Nebraska. And so I came out here not knowing what to expect. It was like the first day of school all over again for me. And I was a little bit nervous. But uh, everyone was so welcoming. And it really does feel like family early on. But even with you, I mean, yeah. you and I got to chatting the first day here. And immediately it's just warm, uh, inviting feelings from everybody. And it's just a blessing to be here. And, and that's, the, that's the whole key. I mean, the, the Gulls are the volunteers, and they're the host families. And without them, it doesn't happen. Um, and we all have to work together, no matter what it is. And I used to come up here with, uh, with, with Nick, and, you know, it was always fun for me. And, um, you know, but we all get to know each other. We get to know the players. I mean, this team, this is a special team this year. They've been very resilient. Uh, and, and I see a likeness uh, almost to the 14 team where it was kind of a roller coaster ride all season. And you wondered what was going to happen. And then crunch, crunch time would come, no days off, double headers, 
you know, you're on the road and, and you win. And you, you this team just seems to be, they like each other. And they're playing well together. And I think you bring up another excellent point. The last time the goals won the NECPL was in 2014. And now you're seeing a similar likeness here as Chris Hamilton gives this one a charge, but it's hooking foul in right field. One and one now the count, but this team, it, it was kind of up and down the whole season. They couldn't find that hot streak, and they found it here recently. I mean, they've been crushing the ball, and that's exactly when you want to heat up is around playoff time. I mean, it was the same thing in 14. It, you know, it was uh, early July, and we were sitting here, and it was a doubleheader, and it wasn't going well, and then they just clicked, and this team has done the same thing, um, and, and they're just a likable bunch. They really are, and they like to be with each other. Yeah, I think, you know, that just goes through the whole Newport organization. We talked about how everyone is so warm and welcoming, but even with the players, too, I mean, all of them are just out there having fun, enjoying each other, and it makes for a great product on the field. Um, now, you've been with the team for quite some time. How many of the championships, the goals have won six. How many of them have you seen here as a part of the goals? All of them. All of them. And so, I mean, all you are the man for the goals. You've been here the whole time. Yeah. And just, see them all. I mean, how special is it, some of those postseason runs? It, there's, there's nothing like it. I mean, uh, they're all special. But the one that was the most, the most special to me was that 14 team. They were just a bunch of dirt dogs, and you know they had uh, they had one player, uh, a kid the last name is Salter, who was from Michigan, I think, or Michigan State, and uh, he carried this team on his back that year. And um, to go up to Maine and win it in Maine was pretty special, you know. Yeah, I mean that's such I mean it's such a long bus ride, and you worry about oh are the guys gonna be fresh, but as you said, a bunch of them just being a bunch of dirt dogs out there, able to grind it out and get that victory for the sixth. Uh, any CBL championship they, for the goals. They were holding the pitching staff together with, with bubble gum and, uh, and packing <laughs> tape that year. All right. I mean, I still wonder how they did it. But uh, and that's a credit to the coaches. Uh, we had you know, Mike Coombs here and Kevin Long kept that pitching staff together. And uh, they were on pitch counts and um, they figured it out. Yeah, able they to figure it out. balance all that. It does speak to the coaching staff and. Uh, talent two of the goals able to power through as that first pitch to Malloy is in there for strike one. Chris Hamilton went down swinging on strikes, so there is one away here in the seventh. And I got to say, I did get a text. Well, the whole group of us got a text the other day from Coach Coombs when he uh, when he found out they were in the playoffs. He's been following them all summer, I believe, but. He was pretty excited about the fact that they were back into the playoffs too. Coach Coombs was the longtime manager of the Newport Goals. Uh, this year, Kevin Winnero took over for the first time. Uh, but talk about that. Uh, you were around Coombs quite a bit, and he's <laughs> such a character. Uh, do you have any <laughs> stories that you could share about him? There's some pretty colorful stories about <laughs> Mike Coombs. Uh, he, he led the league in throwing bases. Yeah. yeah he, he went out there one year and uh, got a little, little uh, tip with the umpire, and he took first base, and he threw it across into the outfield. It was, it was actually spectacular, right? think if they gave we gave him an award for it actually <laughs> and it deservingly so but he was a colorful guy now as the head of the grounds crew when you see a, a coach going out there kicking all the dirt and throwing bases what's your reaction because you're laughing now but in the moment do you care no <laughs> no you that's love baseball it. yeah you love it that's baseball you know and Mike was a baseball uh, lifer you know and uh, that was his style and it was unique I mean the man won 300 games in the NECBL Oof. I don't know if anybody will ever do that again. Yeah, I mean, you don't do that by accident. You no. have to be a heck of a coach to do that. No. But a team effort. You know, good coaches, good players. You know, uh, it's just, it's it's such a, it's a winning combination, you know, from the top to the bottom. It's now McClinsky looking on to Malloy. It's a one-two count to the Vanderbilt designated hitter. He's going to pop this one up into foul territory. Barry behind the plate is looking for it, and he's not going to track it well. It's going to come back. He overran it. And so Malloy's able to stay alive at the plate. There's not much room back there for the catcher. You don't see too many uh, right. balls caught back here. It, there's almost no room back in foul territory anywhere in Cardines. Yeah. And that's just a product of being such an old field. This field, this field was built around the neighborhood. You, uh, you can see that the way it you know, twists and turns in the outfield. But it's in the center of Newport. But this, this was reclaimed land. When they, well, before they named it Cardines Field, it was called the Basin. And um, they reclaimed this land, and 
before they did that, at high tide, this used to fill with water. Right. You know. And people used to complain about the, the mosquitoes around here oh, yeah. and all that, and so they had to sw switch. It was a swamp. Was it, it was, yeah. It was a swamp. I mean, it was it was called the basin, the and basin. so they switched it to, to Cardine's Field and developed uh, such a beautiful site for us. It's it's a unique uh, it's a unique ballpark. It's a it's a gem. It's a baseball gem. Is that two two is cut on and missed for strike three, second in a row for. McClinsky here in the seventh. Although it, there will be an error off of Barry with the uh, missed catch as well. So another error registered for both of these teams tonight. So there's two away now for Brett Vosick at the plate. Now one thing I have to, you know, talk to you about. I'm in a suit every day and I, I'm always complaining in the hot days in July. <laughs> oh man, this is so tough. How, I don't know how you do it because you're actually doing labor out there. I mean, you battle through it and you're a pro. You can you lose a few pounds out there, <laughs> for sure, you know, and I can afford to lose a I few can't, pounds. So I can't. Uh, you can't, that's for sure, <laughs> but I can. So I'll, I'll be happy to give you a few. Uh, not a problem. <laughs> that's a fair trade yeah, to me. Yeah, I'll sure, take you up not? on that any day. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. How did you enjoy your first summer? Oh, my gosh. I mean, I am so blessed to yeah. be here. I'm talking about the family atmosphere, everyone just being so so great to work with as this one's going to be popped up into the infield and caught by Barmakian for out number three. But... I really am just so blessed to be here because, like I said, it was the first day of school again for me, and I was a little bit nervous. You know, how am I going to fit in? Am I everyone going to be uh, fun to work with? And it's just been the best experience. It, it truly is like a family atmosphere here, and it feels like a uh, family that I have here in Newport. But on top of that, I'm calling baseball games every day. I'm seeing parts of the northeast part of the country that I've never seen. So uh, I just I think I have it made out here this summer. I'm absolutely I think I'm the most fortunate person out there for, for at least the 2019 summer. It's a dream. It you really know, it's is. It's a dream. You know, I, I grew up, you know, listening. I love listening to baseball on the radio, by the way. I'm really old school. And I grew up listening to back way back in the day when the Red Sox with Kirk Gowdy. And then, you know, we had guys like Ken Coleman and then Martin. And, you know, now you've got Joe Castiglione right. and all those great. And we've always been lucky to have great announcers. But uh, you're going you're gonna to be there someday. <laughs> I can tell. You you're are gonna be a, you're gonna oh be yeah. the next Vince Scully, all oh right? Oh man, you're too kind. You're too kind. Well, <laughs> we held you here for an inning. I have, it's we my pleasure. It. Are you kidding me? This is great. You're welcome back anytime. So Thanks, I'm my we'll let you off the hook. You can enjoy the rest of the game. Okay, guys. Rick Lombardi, Thanks everybody. Thanks very much. The head of the grounds crew for the Newport Goals. As he joined us for the whole seventh inning. So we get set for action here in the eighth. It's still five to one Newport on top as it was a 1-2-3 inning for the goals in the bottom of the seven to get us here. Thanks, man. Thank you. My pleasure. That was fun. Nice to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> Sansone still out there on the mound for the goals as he'll be facing off against the 9-1-2 hitters for the Schooners here in the eighth. Sansone in his only inning of relief so far here today went Three up, three down for the Mystic Schooners at the plate, including a backwards K against Seamus Barry. This first offering to the lefty McGuire at the plate. Breaking ball cut on and missed. 0-1. Nick Bello rejoins us here in the booth. Nick, I know you had to step aside for, for Rick to get in the booth, but you're familiar with Rick Lombardi, and he is just one of the most infectious guys out there on the field. His personality is just so warm and enjoyable as this one's going to be chopped back to Sansone. He flips over to first in time for out number one. But any time you are with Rick Lombardi, it's, it's a good day. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Rick is just one of the many people here in Newport who is just, I mean, the hospitality at this place is bar none. Uh, but Rick is definitely one of the leaders here in Newport. Great guy. And we're lucky to have him here. And I talked about, you know, the dog days of July. And he's out there doing hard work with the field. He always has a smile on his face, and you got to uh, appreciate that because uh, I know I wouldn't have a smile on my face in those situations. And, uh, he's always able to do so, and that's just what makes him who he is, is that first pitch to Barmakian missed up. 1-0 now. I mean, absolutely. I mean, we were out there in June running wires. Is that 1-0 pitch, fastball misses up 1-1. Running wires here at the field, and we certainly did not have a smile on our <laughs> face. And Rick's out here, you know, 100-degree weather, in the middle of July, or he's out there in the pouring rain trying to get a tarp on the field, so. This 2-0 pitch fastball misses inside 3-0. He called Cardeen's a gem, but really I think Rick's one of the gems of the Newport organization, and we're lucky enough to be around him 
uh, for the whole summer and to have him up here in the booth for the whole seventh inning. But Sansone is looking on to Barmakia now on the 3-0. That fastball catches the top half of the zone. 3-1. Barmakian coming into this plate appearance. Two for three on the day with a pair of singles and representing the only run of the day for the Schooners so far. This 3-1 offering, another fastball missing up for ball four. So first walk of the day for Sansone on the mound and with one away, there's now a runner on first for the Schooners. Yeah, Schooners looking to bounce back. And it's now or never really and you only got two innings to really play with realistically to sit, kind of grab back four runs, maybe push it into extras, but in reality, bare minimum, try and tie this ball game in, in, in two innings and really shut down the goals in the bottom halves. That first pitch breaking ball is going to be lined foul over the dugouts here at Cardines and into the streets of Newport. 0-1 now to beam. Yeah, Almost scooters. taking some ha uh, heads off of fans out there. <laughs> Right, that was close. Schooners down to their final five outs, though, and so at this point, you just want base runners uh, any way you can get them. And who better to generate than the top of the order in, in, in reality? Sansone looking over at first on the 0-1. Fastball in there for strike two. Beam on the day, 0 for 3. Pair of ground outs reached on a fielder's choice in the third. Now Sansone working from the third base side of the rubber. Ahead in this count. Lefty on righty matchup for him. On the 0-2. Breaking ball cut on and popped back into the screen. Count remains. Yeah, Beam has been trying to work his bet all night tonight and not find anything that he likes to capitalize. Nothing too uh, heavily hit for him. Uh, two very short ground outs and like, like I said, that, that field is short. So, Nothing really big coming from him tonight. We're maybe going to see one more base hit, if that. This 0-2 breaking ball going to be grounded right back to Sansoni. Looks to second, but throws to first in time for out number two. But Barmakia does move up into scoring position for the Scooters. Yeah, good check down there by Sansoni to look the runner off at second and then just throw the ball over at first for the second out of the inning. Yeah, I like it being conservative on the play because you don't want to force a throw to second, end up in center field, and have a big mistake. You take the one, you're trading outs right now. Four runs, it didn't result in a run, but it puts a runner in scoring position. So smart play from Sansone on the mound as that brings up T.T. Bowens. Lefty on righty matchup, first offering, breaking ball that stays up for ball one. Yeah, you know, another thing I like about that is most pitchers in that situation, you know, you're probably not going to get the guy out at second, so what's the point of even checking down there? But Sansone, he checked down to see if he was, you know, kind of jogging or dogging it down to second, and it made, it made the throw over to first. Now Sansone on the 1-0. Fastball cut on and missed from Bowens. A pitch that was just beneath the zone, 1-1. One and one. Yeah, Bowens has been getting some well-hit balls, uh, no capitalization on it, unable to really put anything in motion. But he, it's going to be down to him for this at-bat to get something going. He nubs this one off the end of his bat towards the dugouts here at Cardines. One and two. Bowens is one for two on the day. Last time up, reached on a single. Also has a sacrifice RBI fly in the first that brought in Barmakian. Or the only run of the day for Mystic so far. It's now Sansone looking over at second. On the one two. Fastball going to be driven in the left, but hooking foul towards the bullpens. Count remains. That one scattered the schooners part of the bullpen as well, forcing uh, Peter Myers to go retrieve the ball. Bowen's just out in front there, so if you're Sansone on the mound, you have to be. Cautious of that, a little bit weary of throwing to Bowens now with what pitch you're going to select. Now Sansone on the 1-2 offering. Changeup going to be line two. Holzwasser at short, who's there for out number three. So no runs crossed for the Scooters in the eighth off of no hits and a walk. They leave one stranded. Heading into the bottom of the eighth. Still 5-1 to one goals here on the NECBL broadcast network. Bam. Bottom of the eighth, Newport on top, five to one. And there's a new pitcher out there for the Schooners. Yeah, it's number 10, Nick Rubino. 
The closer for the Mystic Schooners, absolute nasty fastball. He can blow this by as many kids as he wants to. To Wilmington, Delaware, and Wagner College, 158 EO right in 17 games appeared. Four wins, one loss, five saves. He got 17 full innings pitched, 27 strikeouts, four walk batters, and 15 hits off of him. And he has been absolute dominant when it comes to the mound at the end of the game. Yeah, and he's been that end of the game guy that's been able to close it down for the Schooners. He was going to be the closing pitcher in the Southern Division All for the Southern Division All Stars in the All Star game, but of course that game got rained out. But the fact that he was voted to be that just goes to show how dominant he is out there. But it is the bottom of the eighth. I'm going to send it over to our field reporter, Nick Bello, to catch us up on the scores around the league. Thank you, Stephen. We only have one game tonight, so I'll make this quick. 3-0 Vermont in going into the top of the fourth. That first pitch to Bender. He's going to pop it up in the foul territory along the first base side. Bowen's giving chase towards the warehouse, and he can't make the play. So it's an 0-1 count now to Bender. And so Vermont, the three seed in the Northern Division is leading Valley right now. and uh, All of them are talented teams in the Northern Division. You wonder if maybe Valley's being a little bit tired out there because they had that doubleheader just a day ago. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this division has been a very, very close, very tight race throughout most of the season. And this is no surprise to see a three seed up on a two seed right now. Now Rubino looking on on the 0-1. He's working out of the stretch. It's a slider that misses outside for ball one. Bender on the day, 0 for 2, but he has reached base on a fielder's choice. Last time up, a sacrifice fly into right field. That drove in another Newport goals run as he's going to line this one towards the third base side and foul. Count now 1 and 2. Rubino has been struggling the past few games that he has seen. Really, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's just been absolutely gassed uh, throughout the remainder of the season, being one of the main closer for the Schooners. But... He's been wavering on the on the corners of the zone where he normally just paints them so well. It's now Rubino on the one two breaking ball that just misses up two and two. This is a guy in Colton Bender who's really disciplined at the plate. Eleven walks on the season, to just 14 strikeouts now. But to have played that many games and only have 14 strikeouts, it's quite impressive from Bender as he watches this two two fastball miss low and away for ball three. And the same can be said about a lot of guys in this new part line. We talk about Bender, Holzwasser, Molloy. I mean, these guys can really work a walk. Now on the 3-2. Fastball cut on and missed above the zone. Four strike three. So there's one away here in the eighth. That's the first strikeout of the day for Rubino on the mound. And that last fastball is what we generally see out of Rubino, you know, right down the middle, able to, to just squeak by the batter, uh, maybe catch him off guard, but he really works it in between that changeup, that fastball. Very good sequencing, generally speaking, coming out of Rubino. So that now brings up Hayden Jones. Third baseman tonight for the goals. Watches his first pitch. Breaking ball drop into the zone for strike one. Jones is one for three on the day, singled his first time up. The rocket up the middle. Since then, popped out to short and had a swinging strikeout as that pitch misses up and away from Rabino all the way back to the backstop. Uh, fell out of his hand a little bit early. <laughs> yeah, I was like up in the uh, 40 miles out of the <laughs> way right there. But uh, yeah, definitely slipped out of his hand. Yeah, ball slipping and then he's trying to overthrow some of these balls, so trying to get a little more speed off it. Bad combination. Is that 1-1, one, one, another fastball up, swung on and missed from Jones. Now with that fastball up, it has been working though for Rubino so far. Yeah, we'll see if he goes to uh, goes with it right here to get Jones out as he did with Bender. So Rubino looking on on the one, two, fastball low. It's gonna be grounded through the infield in between first and second and all the way into right. That's the second hit of the day for Jones. And there's one aboard for the goals with one away here in the eighth. Yeah, that was the absolute line of a drive by Jones and very well hit, very well placed. Rubino just trying to catch him with, with, with the fastball, but un unable to do so. And he'll now have to face the bottom of the order and go into a deeper pitch count than he ever wants to. So that will now bring up Joey Bellini. 
Second baseman tonight for the goals. Takes his first pitch and lofts it into foul territory along the right field side. Out of play for strike one. Taking a look at the attendance tonight for this wild card matchup here at Cardines. 2,416 fans came to watch this win or go home game between the goals and scooters. Not too bad. Great night. This pitch is going to be lined over to second softly, and McGuire is there. No play at first, so there's two away here in the eighth. This is what the Schooners need. A, key, a quick, quick few outs, go to the ninth, try and work this thing, push it into nine full innings of work, maybe actually if you're really trying to get something going. That now brings up the nine-hole hitter in the goals lineup, Isaiah Thomas. One for three on the day. Struck out his last time, but also has a single to his name that came in the fourth. So this first pitch, breaking ball that drops low and away, 1-0. and Righty on righty matchup for Rubino on the mound. Working from the first base side of the rubber. On the 1-0, fastball going to be driven into right. Maycock looks to be underneath it. And he is for out number three. So no runs crossed for the goals in the eighth. Off of one hit and no errors as they leave one stranded. Heading into the ninth. The Schooners down to their final three outs as the goals lead five to one here on the NECBL Broadcast Network. Ninth, Schooners down to their final three outs. Then Maycock, Will Lucas, and Nolan Kessinger at the plate for Mystic. As it is Mike Sansone once again out there for the goals. Lefty on lefty matchup for Sansone. First offering is a fastball right down the heart of the plate for strike one. Schooners have not been hitting well up against Sansone. In fact, not at all, as the only time they've reached base was off that walk that was put in play by Steve Barmakian. This whole one pitch is going to be lofted into left field, slicing foul. Cavalieri giving chase, but the speedy URI outfielder can't get there in time. So the count is now 0-2 to Maycock. Looks like Cavalieri almost ended up on America's Cup Avenue for that one. Huh. It's a little bit too far to go for that ball. He sure gave it his all, and it's now an 0-2 count to Maycock, as we said. He's 0-3 on the day. Two flyouts and then a pop-out to Holzwasser at short, his last time up. Count is 0-2 to Maycock, Sansone looking on. On the 0-2, and he swung on and popped back into the screen. Count remains. And this is what you have to do if you're Mystic, especially down in a count, you just have to battle back because you need base runners down to your final three outs. You really do, and it's not going to be generated by the long ball at all. It's going to be generated by some short plays, able to work the gaps, and that is something that the Schooners' bats have been lacking tonight. Now on the 0-2. Fastball up. Swung on and missed for strike three. Two strikeouts on the day for Sansone, and there's one away here in the ninth. And that's not something that you're looking for if you're the Schooners. You can't have guys strike out. You need something put in motion to get guys on base. So Will Lucas will try to get on base now for Mystic. Righty at the plate, facing the lefty on the mound in Sansone as that first pitch missed up and away for ball one. Lucas is 0 for 3 on the night though. Struck out swinging his first time up. Since then has had a ground out and a fly out. Now the 1-0, fastball in there, 1-1. One one. This is where Sansone excels because he likes to work inside on righties too, trying to force some weak contact. Is this 1-1, one one, he goes outside with it. It's a fastball that misses up and away, 2-1. The winner of this game will go on to play the Martha's Vineyard Sharks tomorrow in the start of a three-game series to decide the South as this one's popped up in the shallow left. Holzwasser giving chase, and he's there for out number two. And the Scooters 2019 NECBL season all comes down to this out. 
really does. And Nolan Kessinger gonna be feeling the pressure, but same time, Schooners had a fantastic season and then they're looking to try and at least get some men on, push this thing around and, and give the goals a run for their money. Nolan Kessinger settles in for the Schooners. First offering gonna be swung on and roped into right field. That's gonna get down. One hopping the wall, Kessinger thinking two. They're gonna pump the brakes, play conservative here. It's gonna go back to first. A uh, nice hit there from Kessinger. Really was, and you're gonna need the same deal come from Seamus Berry. Uh, but at the same time, you just need to get guys on, and if, if, if you're gonna draw the walk, draw the walk, but one man at a time, you gotta take the remainder. And you have to like the conservative call on the base pass because you don't wanna be gunned down at second and your season be over. You need more than one run at this point. You need four just to tie. So they kept him at first to make sure they do have that base runner as Seamus Berry settles in. Lefty on lefty matchup, first offering. Fastball gonna be driven into right once again. Vosick giving chase, able to cut it off, but now slipping. And that's gonna be a double at least for the Schooners. The throw to the plate as they send him home is gonna be way over the head of Bender. So it will score a run now for the Schooners and it's five to two. And that was a very, very dangerous play by Seamus Berry going for two, but as soon as he saw Vosick on the ground, he knew he could make it. Kessinger with the speed, and again, that's all you need, one man at a time, get somebody on, and just keep those bases occupied, keep them going. So that will now bring up Justice Burke at the plate for the Schooners. Mystic down to their final out still, but a runner in scoring position in this 5-2 ball game. Lefty on righty matchup for Sansone. The pitch drops beneath the zone, 1-0. And, oh. and Kessinger and Barry hit off of two very well placed balls. Burke and McGuire are gonna need to be, should Burke go on, McGuire come up very conservative and very patient able to read some of these balls. This 1-0 pitch gonna be popped up behind the screen and out of play, one and one. Burke on the day, one for three, singled his first time up, but since then has grounded out to second and popped out the Holzwasser at short. Sansone looking for a final out against the Schooners here in the bottom, top of the ninth. It's this 1-1, one, one. cut on and missed at a fastball up, back into the screen. It's tipped, excuse me, not missed, and it's now a 1-2 count. The Scooter's season down to their final strike. The Cardinals has come alive here for the final strike. <laughs> on the 1-2, check swing, cut on, and they're gonna say he went around four strikes three. So the goals win the wild card game by a score of five to two, and they will advance to the second round of the playoffs to take on the Martha's Vineyard Sharks tomorrow. Don't go anywhere, the goals post game show coming up next here on the NECBL Broadcast Network. It was a winner go home day today in the wild card matchup between the Mystic Schooners and Newport Goals. And the Goals are able to take down Mystic by a score of five to two to advance to the second round of the NECBL playoffs. Stephen Huff alongside the voice of the Mystic Schooners, Laura Hoover, and the field reporter of the Newport Goals, Nick Bello. And it was an exciting game right at the beginning. The Schooners scored an early run in the first. Steve Barmakian singled and later came around to score, but the Goals answered back with two of their own in the first as Chris Hamilton launched his fifth home run of the season, the two run shot to give the goals the lead and they didn't look back from there. They tacked on one more in the fourth. It was a solo shot from Joey Bellini and two more in the fifth. The Schooners tried a valiant effort at the end with the comeback attempt, able to plate one run in the ninth but ultimately it was not enough. As Sam Jacobsack out there on the mound for the goals. Went six innings, gave up just a run off of five hits and two walks, two strikeouts, while Mike Sansone finished the last three innings off with three strikeouts of his own while giving up just one run. But it was a heck of a game. Unfortunate that it has to come to an end. The season has to come to an end for someone. Uh, but the goals 
take this one by a score of five to two. Yeah, Schooners, it's an absolute pleasure, a blessing to be able to cover them for such a long, amazing summer. They came back, they really tried to work the bats, and honestly, they played a very good game. Pitching-wise, came around just as well as I thought it was going to be, and honestly, it was a great game from start to finish, and nothing more to really expect or to be proud of both of these teams. Yeah, it was, it was a great game, a great season for both of them. Um, Newport will advance, but I know this is the schooner's last time. So, Laura, I'll let you, you know, have your moments as you're saying good, goodbye. It was a great year for you, obviously, your first year in the NECPL. Yep. You did a fantastic job with Mystic, and um, watching them out there every day must have been a pleasure. Oh, it was absolute pleasure. Some of these guys, the greatest guys, um, T.T. Bowens, never met a guy more happy. Win or loss, you'll see him come out with a smile on his face. I'm excited to go talk to him after the game, and it is going to be interesting to watch these guys next year. I know a lot of these guys are intending to come back, so we'll be happy to see them. But I, it's been a pleasure knowing you guys. You two are one of the greatest broadcasts uh, so far, and, and helping all of us grow out here. Well, you're too kind. You helped me grow. I Way know that kind. for sure. But <laughs> for the last time, Laura Hoover, thanks for being up here in the booth with, with us. It's always a pleasure. And uh, you, you did a fantastic job this year. Well, thanks for having me, guys, and same to you. Thank you. For Laura Hoover, I'm Stephen Huff. The goals took down the Mystic Schooners in the Southern Division wildcard game by a score of 5-2 to two to keep their championship hopes alive as they will play tomorrow against the Martha's Vineyard Sharks. But I'm now going to send it over to Nick Bello, the field reporter of the Newport Goals. Nick, the postgame is all yours. Thank you, Steven. The goals are moving on in any CBL playoffs. 5-1 to one win in the wild card game tonight over the Mystic Schooners. Once again, I am Nick Bello. I will be joined here shortly by my good friend and business associate, John Perrick. Uh, around the league right now, we got a 4-3 lead for Valley as they have come back in the fifth against Vermont. I'm joined now by John Perrick. Now, John, you know, you're a big goals guy. War, take us through your emotions right now. 5-1 win heading into a, a, uh, a Southern Division Championship Series tomorrow. Well, you know what? This is exactly what the Newport Gulls needed to do. They needed to go out there and they needed to I've been saying it all season long, early and often. They needed to get on the board early. Even though Mystic went up to an early 1-0 lead, Chris Hamilton, big two-run home run, and then followed a few innings later by Joey Bellini's solo shot, and then Newport really opened it up when Justin Henry Malloy had the RBI double, and then everything kind of fell in place. And right now, it's exactly what you wanted. Sam Jacobsack, six strong innings, and the Gulls are in the win column, and they're going to be playing Martha's Vineyard tomorrow night. And it seems like the Gulls have everything going for them right now. They got hot bats. They got, you know, a lot of solid pitching performances out of both their starters and their bullpen. Do you think they'll be able to carry this into the, you know, in, into the next round? Well, you hope so. Of course, Dylan Brown, he's the probable starter for tomorrow. And Dylan, he's had success against Martha's Vineyard. So you hope that they will be able to continue this momentum. Of course, Newport still pretty good in depth for the most part. I know that there are some holes in the corner infield spots, but Hayden Jones looked pretty strong at third base today. That was a great sign. And now Newport just needs to keep it going. They're four wins away from completing this whole entire thing, but it starts tomorrow night. You know, you just said it right there, four wins away. I mean, has it set in for you at all that the goals have, you know, made it this far in the playoffs right now? Well, really, set again, I don't know. Because, <laughs> of course, Mike Coombs, he would always take it one out at a time. This team needs to take it one out at a time. Of course, a lot can change in the next 48 hours. Newport Gulls could find themselves going back in the next 48 hours. But right now, tomorrow night, Gulls need to go out there, do exactly what they did today have a good quality pitching performance, and then be able to tack on some runs in advance. And, you know, Newport defeated the Vin Marcus Vineyard Sharks here on Wednesday. Do you think, you know, they're going to use a similar strategy that they did on Wednesday, or do you think they're going to switch it up against Martha Vineyard? Well, when you talk about a strategy from Wednesday, that was kind of interesting because <laughs> Newport, of course, they went down early. It felt like a lost game. Didn't really have any meaning considering the fact that Martha's Vineyard had already clinched the one seed. However... Newport just strung a few hits late, tacked on an eight-run, um, excuse me, an eight-run spot in, I believe, the seventh inning, and Newport was able to cruise out with that 9-6 victory. 
but really when it comes to strategy it's early and often and it's quality pitching that's what wins New England collegiate baseball games and you know with in terms of pitching we saw Newport bullpen a little bit yes or uh, or two days ago against Winnipesaukee and you know you're running late into these playoffs do you think we're gonna see them bullpen again you know maybe in the middle game here on Wednesday depending on what happens tomorrow well, I think, I think that definitely could be possible. Of course, Newport, they, they're not calling an SOS right now in their um, starting rotation. They still have depth in there. They've got arms. I don't know if we will see a big bullpen day, but again, if it's a game three, go big or go home, Newport's going to have to, and, and say their starting pitching failed them, Newport's going to have to result to their bullpen. And again, at the end of the day, the bullpen is what I believe is the biggest factor for the Newport Gulls moving forward if they will hoist that seventh Favenson Cup. I definitely agree with you on that because last year we had a you know a, a very solid Newport Gulls team, but they lacked you know some depth in the bullpen. And I think that was their kryptonite when it came time for the playoffs. You know they had that one game uh, playing last year that they uh, unfortunately could not capitalize on. But uh, you know going back to this game. We saw a lot of production from a lot of different guys tonight. You, you saw a two-run home run from Hamilton in the first, a uh, solo shot from uh, uh, Joseph Bellini in the fourth, and then you know two great pitching performances from Sansone and your starter, Sam Jacobsack. So, I mean, as as our, our friend over there, you know, tries to find a player of the game, who is your player of the game for tonight? Well. You know, it was a tough one. Of course, Chris Hamilton was excellent at the plate, three for four, but I've got to give it to Jacob Sack. Again, I've, I've said it earlier, I'll say it again, pitching is absolutely key to winning baseball. And Jacob Sack giving Newport that six innings. Again, the goals only wasted two arms today. That's humongous, having to play tomorrow. And, of course, Martha's... Uh, so I think we're going to send it down. Uh, with tonight's player of the game, Sam Jacobsack, of course, he started the game for the goals. He went six innings pitched. He gave up just one run. Everything was working out for you, out there on the mound for you. How were you feeling? What were you seeing out there? Uh, actually, this is probably the worst I felt all year. But uh, I pounded the zone. I had great defense. And Bender had a hell of a game behind the plate today, I thought. Well, to feel the worst on the air and to put a performance like that, <laughs> yeah. that just goes to show how great of a year you're having. Now, of course, this was just your second start. You didn't start this spring either. Were you a little bit nervous out there, especially with the playoff game, or were you feeling good? Uh, I felt good. I mean, all year I've been throwing strikes, so I just tried to do the same thing on the mound for starting. So as long as I had no free bases, I thought it would get a good way to go. They're starting to think you're the man out here. You went six innings pitched the, both times you started, including the playoff game. That has to feel good. It, it does feel good. The fans are awesome. Everyone's awesome here. It's great. All right. Well, Sam Jacobsack was tonight's player of the game. He went six innings pitched while giving up just one run. And I'll send it back up to you guys in the booth. Thank you, Stephen. Once again, the goal is winning 5-1 to one here at home at Cardines for the wild card, wild card playoff game against the Mystic Schooners. Joined here by John Perrick. Now, John, you know, first game is tomorrow against Marcus Muir Sharks. Not a lot of turnaround time, but what do you expect to see from the goals tomorrow? Well, I expect to see, a, I guess, what we've been seeing all year long. A lot of offense and some decent pitching. I'm expecting at least five innings out of Dylan Brown. Hold those Sharks to two, three runs, and hopefully Newport can combat that with a few runs of their own. However, of course, you have to keep in mind the Sharks, they are well-rested. They've had two straight off days, and th so is their pitching rotation. So it should be a good game. Well, thank you, John. And we're sitting down with Stephen Hubbard to close things out. So, Stephen, take it away. So the goals won the wild card game tonight over the Mystic Schooners by a score of 5-2. to two, And we'll be back in action tomorrow as they take on the Martha's Vineyard Sharks. For tonight, I'd like to thank our executive producer and director Tom Lima, producer Shannon Carlson, associate producer Rob Sanchez, audio technician Arthur Smith, on-site engineer Mike Abbott, production assistant Tess Rote, statistician Michael Garman, field reporter Nick Bello, and the voice of the Mystic Schooners Laura Hoover, I'm Stephen Hoff saying goodnight from the city by the sea. Thank you.